Welcome to this New York City 9-11 memorial event sponsored by the Lawyers Committee for 9-11 Inquiry. My name is David Meiswinkel and I'm the president. The program will be divided into two, two parts. The first part will be very solemn. The Reverend Audette Fulbright will read an invocation to us and Fire Commissioner Christopher Joya of Franklin Square Munson will begin a roll call of the victims of 9-11, first responders in New York City. The roll call will consist of Christopher Joya, Ross Muir from the Truth Action Project and myself. On 9-11, 412 first responders in New York City died. 343 of them were firemen. 23 New York City police officers. 37 Port Authority of New York and New Jersey officers. Eight EMT personnel and one officer in a fireboat. 412 valiant heroes lost everything. So today we honor them and we honor their families with a roll call. To begin the program off, we do so with a prayer. Good afternoon. I'm Reverend Audette Fulbright, and on behalf of the All Souls community, I want to welcome you here today and just say, I know you have a long afternoon in front of you, but I do want to say that having served in this community, I know that I frequently, frequently hear from our members and friends how grateful they are for the care and concern and the lives of our first responders. So we join you in spirit today and are grateful that we take this time for memorialization. So I want to ask if you will now just to take a moment to center yourselves as we begin with an opening prayer today. Holy Spirit, name above names, you who have been called in times of wonder and despair, hear our prayer. Be that sustaining presence which holds us as we remember those we have loved and lost. Help us to honor and be faithful to the memory of those who, without consideration of the cost, gave the last full measure of service to humanity. Beloved one, Comfort the grieving. We know that our sorrow and loss never ends, but transmute our pain. Help us to live more fully, more faithfully. Help us to honor their memory by exemplifying the best of what they offered to the world. May our lives also be in service to those who are hurting, those who are frightened and need our help. Protect the rescuers and the rescued. Guide their actions and guide ours. May we remember every day those who have touched our lives, earned our respect, and blessed the world. Holy Spirit, comfort and sustain us. We ask for peace in this lifetime and that the peace of the eternal be upon those whom we have loved and remember now and forever. May it be so. Amen. FDNY Chief Peter J. Gancy, Jr., age 54. 
FDNY Commissioner William M. Feehan, age 72. FDNY Marshal Ronald Paul Buka, age 47. FDNY Chaplain Michael Judge, age 68. Citywide Tour Commanders, Chief Gerard A. Barbara, age 53. Chief Donald J. Burns, age 61. Battalion One, Chief Matthew Lancelot Ryan, age 54. Lieutenant Paul Thomas Mitchell, age 46. Battalion Two, Chief William McGovern, age 49. Chief Richard Prunty, age 57. Faustino Apostle, Jr., age 55. Battalion Four, Lieutenant Thomas O'Hagan, age 43. Battalion Six, Chief John P. Williamson, age 46. Battalion Seven, Chief Oreo Palmer, age 45. Lieutenant Stephen G. Harrell, age 44. Lieutenant Philip Scott Petty, age 43. Battalion 8, Chief Thomas Patrick DeAngelis, age 51. Thomas McCann, age 45. Battalion 9, Chief Dennis Lawrence Devlin, age 51. Chief Edward F. Garrity, age 45. Lieutenant Charles William Garberini, age 44. Carl Asaro, age 39. Alan D. Feinberg, age 48. Battalion 11, Chief John M. Palillo, age 51. Battalion 12, Chief Frederick Claude Sheffold, Jr., age 57. Battalion 22, Lieutenant Charles Joseph Margiata, age 44. Battalion 43, Lieutenant Jeffrey E. Guja, age 49. Battalion 47, Lieutenant Anthony Jovic, age 39. Battalion 48, Chief Joseph Greslak, age 52. Michael Leopoldo Bocchino, age 45. Battalion 49, Chief John Moran, age 42. Battalion 50, Chief Lawrence T. Stack, age 58. Battalion 57, Chief Dennis Cross, age 60. Chief Joseph Ross Marchbanks, Jr., age 47. 
Division I, Captain Joseph D. Farrelly, age 47. Captain Thomas Moody, age 45. Division 11, Captain Timothy M. Stackpole, age 42. Division 15, Chief Thomas Theodore Haskell, Jr., age 37. Captain Martin J. Egan, Jr., age 36. Captain William O'Keefe, age 48. Engine one, Lieutenant Andrew Desperito, age 43. Michael T. Weinberg, age 34. Engine four, Callisto Anaya, Jr., age 35. James C. Riches, age 29. Thomas G. Scholes, age 27. Paul A. Tegmeyer, age 41. Engine five, Manuel Delval Jr., age 32. Engine six, Paul Bayer, age 37. Thomas Holohan, age 36. William R. Johnston, age 31. Engine eight, Robert Paro, age 35. Engine 10, Lieutenant Greg Arthur Addis, age 44. Jeffrey James Olson, age 31. Paul Pansini, age 34. Engine 21, Captain William Francis Burke, Jr., age 46. Engine 22, Thomas Anthony Casoria, age 29. Engine 22, Michael J. Elfertis, Vincent D. Kane, 37, Martin E. McWilliams, 35, Engine 23, Robert McFadden, 30, James Nicholas Papa George, 29. Hector Luis Chirado, Jr., 30. Mark P. Whitford, 31. Captain, oh, engine 26. Captain Thomas Farino, 37. Dana R. Hansen, 29. Engine 33, Lieutenant Kevin Pfeiffer, 42. David Arce, 36. Michael Boyle, 37. Robert Evans, 36. Keithroy Marcellus Maynard, 30. Engine 37, John Giordano, 47. Engine 40, 
Lieutenant John F. Ginley, 37. Kevin Bracken, 37. Michael D. Diaria, 25. Bruce Gary, 51. Michael F. Lynch, 30. Stephen Mercado, 38. Engine 50, Robert W. Spear, Jr., 30. Engine 54, Paul John Gill, 34. Jose Guadalupe, 37. Leonard Raja Ilya, 36. Christopher Santora, 23. Engine 55, Lieutenant Peter L. Freund, 45. Robert Lane, 28. Christopher Mozillo, 27. Stephen P. Russell, 40. Engine 58, Lieutenant Robert B. Nagel, 55. Engine 74, Ruben D. Correa, 44. Engine 201, Lieutenant Paul Richard Martini, 37. Gregory Joseph Buck, 37. Christopher Pickford, 32. John Albert Schart, 34. Engine 205, Lieutenant Robert Francis Wallace, 43. Engine 207, Carl Henry Joseph, 25. Sean Edward Powell, 32. Kevin O'Reilly, 28. Engine 214, Lieutenant John Bedigan, 35. John Joseph Florio, 33. Michael Edward, Edward Roberts, 31. Kenneth Thomas Watson, 39. Engine 216. Daniel Schur, 37. Engine 217. Lieutenant Kenneth Phelan, 41. Stephen Coakley, 36. Neil Joseph Levy, 34. Engine 219. John Chipura, 39. Engine 226. David Paul DeRubio, 38. Paul Michalizzi, 36. Stanley S. Samalga, Jr., 36. Engine 230. Lieutenant Brian G. Ahern, 43. Frank Bononimo, 42. Michael Scott Carlo, 34. Jeffrey Stark, 30. Eugene Whelan, 31. Edward James White III, 30. Engine 235, Lieutenant Stephen Bates, 42. Nicholas Paul Chiofalo, 39. Francis Esposito, 32. Lee S. Failing, 28. Lawrence G. Vailing, 44. Engine 238, Lieutenant Glenn E. Wilkinson, 46. Engine 279, Ronnie Lee Henderson, 52. Michael Raguzia, 29. Anthony Rodriguez, 36. Engine 285, Raymond R. York, 45. Hayes Matt Operations, Chief John Fanning, 54. 
Hazmat, one. Lieutenant John A. Kriske, 48. Dennis M. Carey, 51. Martin N. DeMeo, 47. Thomas Gardner, 39. Jonathan R. Holman, 48. Dennis Scalzoso, 46. Kevin Joseph Smith, 47. Ladder two, Captain Frederick Ill Jr., 49. Michael J. Clark, 27. George T. Pisquale, 33. Dennis P. Germain, 33. Daniel Edward Harlan, 41. Carl Molinaro, 32. Dennis Michael Mulligan, 32. Ladder three, Captain Patrick J. Brown, 48. Lieutenant Kevin W. Donnelly, 43. Michael Carroll, 39. James Raymond Coyle, 26. Gerard Dewan, 35. Jeffrey John Giordano, 45. Joseph Maloney, 45. John Kevin McAvoy, 47. Timothy Patrick McSweeney, 37. Joseph J. Orgren, 30. Stephen John Olson, 38. Ladder four, Captain David Terence Woolley, 54. Lieutenant Daniel O'Callaghan, 42. Joseph Angelini, Jr., 38. Peter Brennan, 30. Michael E. Brennan, 27. Michael Haub, 34. Michael F. Lynch, 33. Samuel Oitis, 45. John James Tipping II, 33. Ladder, 5. Lieutenant Vincent Francis Giamona, 40. Lieutenant Michael Warchola, 51. Louis Arena, 32. Andrew Brunn, 28. Thomas Hannafin, 36. Paul Hanlon Keating, 38. John A. Santori, 49. Gregory Thomas Salcedo, 31. Ladder seven, Captain Vernon Allen Richard, 53. George Kane, 35. Robert Joseph Foyte, 42. Charles Mendez, 38. Richard Muldowney Jr., 40. Vincent Princiota, 39. Ladder eight, Lieutenant Vincent Jared Holleron, 43. Ladder nine, Gerard Baptista, 35. John P. Tierney, 27. Jeffrey P. Waltz, 37. Ladder 10, Sean Patrick Tallon, 26. Ladder 11, Lieutenant Michael Quilty, 42. Michael F. Camerata, 22. Edward James Day, 45. John F. Heffernan, 37. Richard John Kelly, Jr., 50. Robert King, Jr., 36. Matthew Rogan, 37. Ladder 12, Angel L. Jarby, Jr., 35. Michael D. Mullen, 34. Ladder 13, Captain Walter G. Hines, 46. Thomas Hetzel, 33. Dennis McHugh, 34. Thomas E. Sabella, 44. Gregory Stachk, 46. Ladder 15, Lieutenant Joseph Jared Levy, 45. Richard Lannard Ellen, 30. Arthur Thaddeus Berry, 35. Thomas W. Kelly, 50. Scott Koptiko, 32. Scott Larson, 35. Douglas E. Oschlager, 36. Eric T. Olson, 41. Ladder 16, Lieutenant Raymond E. Murphy, 46. Robert Curtolo, 31. Ladder 20, Captain John R. Fisher, 46. John Patrick Burnside, 36. James Michael Gray, 34. Ladder 20, 
Sean S. Hanley, 35. David LaForge, 50. Robert Thomas Lenane, 33. Robert D. McMahon, 35. Ladder 21. Gerald T. Atwood, 38. Gerard Duffy, 53. Keith Glasgow, 38. Joseph Henry, 25. William E. Krakowski, 36. Benjamin Suarez, 34. Ladder 24. Captain Daniel J. Brethel, 43. Stephen Elliott Belson, 51. Ladder 25. Lieutenant Glenn C. Perry, 41. Matthew Barnes, 37. John Michael Collins, 42. Kenneth Kumpel, 42. Robert Manara, 54. Joseph Ravelli, 43. Paul G. Ruback, 50. Ladder 27, John Marshall, 35. Ladder 35, Captain Frank Callahan, 51. James Andrew Giberson, 43. Vincent S. Morello, 34. Michael Otten, 42. Michael Roberts, 30. Ladder 38, Joseph Spore Jr., 35. Ladder 42, Peter Alexander Befield, 44. Ladder 101, Lieutenant Joseph Gullickson, 37. Patrick Byrne, 39. Salvatore B. Calabro, 38. Brian Canizaro, 30. Thomas J. Kennedy, 36. Joseph Mafio, 31. Terence A. McShane, 37. Ladder 105. Captain Vincent Brunton, 43. Thomas Richard Kelly, 39. Henry Alfred Miller, Jr., 51. Dennis Oberg, 28. Ladder 111. Frank Anthony Palumbo, 46. Lieutenant Christopher P. Sullivan, 39. Ladder 118, Lieutenant Robert M. Regan, 48. Joseph Agnello, 35. Vernon Paul Cherry, 49. Scott Matthew Davidson, 33. Leon Smith Jr., 48. Peter Anthony Vega, 36. Ladder 131, Christian Michael Otto Regenhard, 28. Ladder 132, Andrew Jordan, 36. Michael Kiefer, 25. Thomas Ming Mignon, 34. John T. Vigiano II, 36. Sergio Villanueva, 33. Ladder 136, Michael Joseph Cawley, 32. Rescue 1, Captain Terence S. Hatton, 41. Lieutenant Dennis Moicha, 50. Joseph Angelini Sr., 63. Gary Guidel, 44. William Henry, 49. Kenneth Joseph Marino, 40. Michael Montesi, 39. Gerard Terrence Nevins, 46. Patrick J. O'Keefe, 44. Brian Edward Sweeney, 29. David M. Weiss, 41. Rescue two, Lieutenant Peter C. Martin, 43. William David Lake, 44. Daniel F. Libretti, 43. Jo John Napolitano, 32. Kevin O'Rourke, 44. Lincoln Quape, 38. Edward Rawl, 44. Rescue three. Christopher Joseph Blackwell, 42. Thomas Foley, 32. 
Thomas Gambino Jr., 48. Raymond Meisenheimer, 46. Donald G. Donald J. Reagan, 47. Gerard Patrick Schrang, 45. Rescue four. Captain Brian Hickley, 47. Lieutenant Kevin Dowdle, 46. Terrence Patrick Farrell, 45. William J. Mahoney, 37. Peter Allen Nelson, 42. Darrell V. Pearsall, 34. Rescue five. Captain Louis Joseph Modafieri, 45. Lieutenant Harvey Harrell, 49. Lieutenant Joseph A. Mascali, 44. John P. Berrigan, 39. Carl Vincent Binney, 44. Michael Curtis Fiore, 46. Andre G. Fletcher, 37. Douglas Charles Miller, 34. Jeffrey Matthew Palazzo, 33. Nicholas P. Rosamondo, 35. Alan Tvarzvizic, 45. Safety Battalion, Robert J. Crawford, 62. Special Operations, Chief Raymond Matthew Downey, 63. Chief Charles Casper, 54. Captain Patrick J. Waters, 44. Lieutenant Timothy Higgins, 43. Lieutenant Michael Thomas Russo, Sr., 44. Squad One, Captain James M. Amato, 43. Lieutenant Edward A. Dietri, 38. Lieutenant Michael Esposito, 41. Lieutenant Michael N. Fodor, 53. Brian Bilcher, 37. Gary Box, 37. Thomas M. Butler, 37. Peter Carroll, 42. Robert Gordas, 28. David J. Fontana, 37. Matthew David Garvey, 37. Stephen Gerard Silner, 34. Squad 18, Lieutenant William E. McGinn, 43. Eric Allen, 44. Andrew Fredericks, 40. David Halderman, 40. Timothy Haskell, 34. Manuel Mojica, 37. Lawrence Virgilio, 38. Squad 41, Lieutenant Michael K. Healy, 42. Thomas Patrick Cullen III, 31. Robert Hamilton, 43. Michael J. Lyons, 32. Gregory Siskorski, 34. R. Bruce Van Hein, 48. Squad 252, Terrell Coleman, 32. Thomas Kvaichkis, 48. Peter J. Langon, 41. Patrick Lyons, 34. Kevin Pryor, 28. Squad 288, Lieutenant Ronald T. Kerwin, 42. Ronnie E. Geis, 43. Joseph Hunter, 31. Jonathan Lee Lapeep, 29. Adam De Rand, David Rand, 30. Timothy Matthew Welty, 34. EMS Battalion, 49. Paramedic Carlos R. Lillo, 37. EMS Battalion, 57. Paramedic Ricardo J. Quinn, 40. Port Authority, Superintendent Fernandand V. Maroni, 63. 
Chief James A. Romito, 51. Lieutenant Robert D. Siri, 39. Inspector Anthony P. Infante, Jr., 47. Captain Kathy Nancy Maza, 46. Sergeant Robert M. Calfers, 49. Donald James McIntyre, 38. Walter Arthur McNeil, 53. Joseph Michael Navas, 44. James Nelson, 40. Alphonse J. Niedermeyer, 40. James Wendell Farham, 32. Dominic A. Pelzulo, 36. Anthony Antonio J. Rodriguez, 35. Richard Rodriguez, 31. Bruce Albert Reynolds, 41. Christopher C. Amoroso, 29. Port Authority, Morris V. Barry, 48. Clinton Davis, Sr., 38. Donald A. Foreman, 53. Greg J. Froner, 46. Eruhu Congo Houston, 32. George G. Howard, 44. Thomas E. Gorman, 41. Stephen Putzko, Jr., 44. Paul William Jurgens, 47. Liam Callahan, 44. Paul Lesnicki, 49. David Prudency Lemans, 30, 27. John Joseph Lennon, Jr., 44. John Dennis Levy, 50. James Francis Lynch, 47. John P. Scala, 31. Walwyn W. Stewart, Jr., 28. Kenneth J. Tichton, 31. Nathaniel Webb, 56. Michael T. Woley, 34. New York City PD, Sergeant Timothy A. Roy, Sr., 36. Sergeant John Jared Coughlin, 43. Sergeant Rodney C. Gillis, 33. Sergeant Michael S. Curtin, 45. Detective Joseph V. Vigiano, 34. Detective Claude Daniel Richards, 46. Maria Ann Smith, Ramon Suarez, 45. Paul Talty, 40. Santos Valentin, Jr., 39. Walter E. Weaver, 30. Ronald Philip Klupper, 39. Thomas M. Lejone, 39. James Patrick Leahy, 38. Brian Grady McDonald, 38. John William Perry. Glenn Karen Pettit, 30. John D. Alara, 47. Vincent Dance, 38. Jerome M. P. Dominix, 37. Stephen P. Driscoll, 38. Mark Joseph Ellis, 26. Robert Fazio, Jr., 41. Manuel Mojica, 37. Lawrence Vigio, 28. Keith Fairbin, 24, a paramedic who worked for the New York Presbyterian Hospital. Richard Perlman, 18, an EMT who worked for the Forest Hills Volunteer Ambulance. Mario Santoro, 28, a paramedic who worked for the New York Presbyterian Medical Center. Yelmo Marino, 24, a single mother of an eight-year-old son who worked as an MT for MetroCare Montefiore Medical Center for three years. Mohammed Salam Hamandi, 23, Muslim American who worked as a part-time uh, fire a certified EMT, New York City Fire Department, also a member of the New York City Police Department Cadet Corps for three years. Mark Sullins, 30, an EMT who worked with Cabrini Medical Center. Mark Schwartz, 50, an EMT who worked for a Hunter Ambulance. Jo Jeff Simpson, a New York Fire, fire Patrol Unit 2 officer. Keith 
Roma. Now that concludes the reading of the names of the victims of the 9-11, the first responders, as I said, 412. And when you hear those names and you hear those ages, you realize they were at the best times of their life, possibly, and probably with families. So we dedicate this ceremony to them, those unsung heroes and their families. And we'd like to commemorate that right now with the pipe and drums.
Thank you very much. I guess the only thing I can say is we will never forget. And uh, I want to thank very much the, the bagpipe and drummer for setting the tone for today. Yeah. The uh, topic of my talk is the importance of the grand jury. And uh, as you may know that there has never been as far as we know, a criminal investigation resulting in a grand jury in this country reference to New York City, the evidence at New York City of pre-planted explosives and controlled demolition. Now, the Lawyers Committee for 9-11 Inquiry submitted a grand jury petition in April 10th of last year amended it in uh, July 30th of last year. That was 54 pages. It had 57 exhibits. Those exhibits are dispositive, we'd like to say in legal jargon, of controlled demolition of uh, bombs and incendiaries involved in bringing down the towers. We uh, recently, Mick Harrison and myself, talked to the Chief of Terrorism, International Terrorism, Narcotics, Michael Ferreira, because we wanted to know what the, the progress was because we had received in November a letter from the U.S. Attorney telling us he had read and reviewed the petition for a grand jury, that he uh, acknowledged the law we cited, which was USC uh, 18, USC 3332A, and that he would comply with the law, which mandates him, mandates him, it's not discretionary, to call a special grand jury and present that evidence to the grand jury. So not hearing anything, we have taken it upon ourselves to call them, and what we were told is they could not disclose uh, anything to us because it was all in secret. All right, now our attorneys, and uh, Mick Harrison, will be briefly coming up here. He's a litigation director and other attorneys. Uh, we, we looked into this and there's case law that, that shows that uh, we are entitled to certain things and they call ministerial records and, and some substantive records. And uh, so what we've done yesterday, yesterday was filed the lawyers committee, Richard Gage and others to be named, have filed a lawsuit against William Barr, U.S. Attorney, and, and Jeffrey Berman, the uh, U.S. Attorney in the Southern District here in Manhattan. And it's a mandamus lawsuit. It basically says, do what you're supposed to do, convene the grand jury. And it also in part is a a, a suit to disclose public records because under common law, we're entitled that to those records, at least some of them. And under uh, the First Amendment, you have entitlement to those records also. So without getting into the particulars, to let you know that the Lawyers Committee has taken another step further to get a grand jury moving, all right? Now, in that grand jury was 57 exhibits. There are now 60 because a few days ago, we submitted three new exhibits. One exhibit has to do with a resolution which uh, Commissioner Joy will talk about. Another exhibit has to do with a report uh, from J. Leroy Halsey that Richard Gage will no doubt talk about. And the third exhibit is something that the Lawyers Committee has done. We've taken a transcript or a deposition over two hours of a operating engineer who worked in the towers or who knew, who was familiar with the towers, who knew people that worked in the towers, and he received information that there was, quote, ghost crews or mystery crews coming in for three months prior to 9-11 on Saturday from midnight to eight o'clock in the morning. They came into those buildings, 
They did not have to give any identification. They came in an unmarked van, left in an unmarked van. They had no ID on them, no identification on their logo, no logo. They were not required to sign in. They didn't have to log in. There was no work orders for them. There was no checks of insurance to cover whatever they were doing there. They were escorted into the building to the telecommunications room, which is adjacent to the elevators, adjacent to the central columns in the buildings. And we gave that report as an exhibit, exhibit 60, to the US attorney to investigate what this gentleman said, this operating engineer, to start connecting the dots. So what we're announcing today to lawyers committee is that there is a lawsuit to force or hopefully be cooperative to get a grand jury moving. And there's additional exhibits to give every reason why there should be an investigation, never a criminal investigation. Now these, this, when I say dispositive of, of controlled demolition, there's a lot of proofs some of them you'll see today, but maybe the strongest one to me, besides the nanothermite, this was a military explosive in the dust, et cetera, the high heat, the gravity fall, is the 155 first responders who said they experienced sounds and sights of explosives. And they were never called to the 9-11 commission for a statement. We have their statements. If you go to lc4911.org, you can read the statements on our website. This is going to be a long process. It has been. We have to take it up another level. This is really a spiritual battle. We're in a church. We pray. And whatever evil is out there that's caused this, we want to address it. Good place to start is through prayer. Thank you. It's my great pleasure to introduce the former Marine and the fire commissioner in Franklin Square Munson and his fellow commissioners have just done an historic resolution and vote, and now are, are taking the lead to try to get some truth and integrity to an investigation to what happened on 9-11. I would like to introduce Commissioner Christopher Joya. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank, thank you very much, David. Good afternoon, David and honored guests. My name is Christopher Joya, and I'm a fire commissioner with the Franklin Square Munson Fire District in the town of Franklin Square, New York, Nassau County which is near the Queens border. I'm a Marine Corps veteran, and I've been an active volunteer firefighter with the Franklin Square and Munson Fire Department for 33 years. I am also a former EMT and an ex-chief, having served five years in that position. I am currently employed as a construction surveyor with Local 15 Operating Engineers in New York City, having worked in the heavy construction industry for the past 30 years, specializing in reinforced concrete, major foundations, and structural steel. On the morning of September 11, 2001, I was working on the Brooklyn side of the East River, just north of the Williamsburg Bridge, and I had a spectacular view of Manhattan and the Twin Towers. Having been an eyewitness to the attacks that day, and from being called to duty 
to assist the Fire Department of New York in the following days and weeks afterwards, 9-11 has never been far from my thoughts, having been burned forever into my psyche. That night, as I lay in bed numb with shock and disbelief, a wicked lightning and thunderstorm descended on the town of Franklin Square. It was the kind of thunder that crashed and reverberated and shook the walls of the house down to the foundation. It was a bad storm and I remember thinking that the heavens had opened up and all that hatred and evil that was perpetrated that day was spilling out all around us and that God was truly angry about this and that this was an omen of things to come. Now, almost 18 years later, life is somewhat normal. The country is still at war with that faceless, nameless enemy that knows no territorial boundaries, yet manages to provoke this country into attacking sovereign nations without a formal declaration of war from Congress or without any independently corroborated intelligence or information as to why a military intervention is justified or needed. Present. <laughs> Presently, when the Pentagon says our military must attack, who would dare question that? It's the all-encompassing and never-ending war on terror, and it stems from the attacks on 9-11, 2001. The 9-11 Commission concluded that Osama bin Laden and a group of Islamic terrorists were responsible and carried out the attacks, and that was to be the end of it. Truth be told, this is far from the end of it. The 9-11 Commission was flawed, and in the words of two of its own, the chairman and the vice chairman of the 9-11 Commission, respectively, Thomas Keene and Lee Hamilton, stated in their book, without precedent, that they were, quote, set up to fail, end quote, and were starved of funds to do a proper investigation. They also confirmed that they were denied access to the truth and misled by senior officials in the Pentagon and the Federal Aviation Authority, and that this obstruction and deception led them to contemplate slapping officials with criminal charges. The final report did not examine key evidence and neglected serious anomalies in the various accounts of what happened. The commissioners themselves admit their report was incomplete and flawed and that many questions about the terror attacks remain unanswered. Nevertheless, the 9-11 Commission was swiftly closed down on August 21st, 2004. The failings of the official investigation have fueled too many half-baked conspiracy theories. Some of the 9-11 truth groups promote speculative hypotheses, ignore innocent explanations, cite non-expert sources, and jump to conclusions that are not proven by the known facts. They convert mere coincidence and circumstantial evidence into cast iron proof. This is no way to debunk the obfuscations and evasions of the 9-11 report. But even amid the hype, some of these 9-11 groups raise valid and important questions that were never even considered, let, let alone answered by the official investigation. The bottom line here is that the American public has not been told the complete truth about the events of that fateful autumn morning almost 18 years ago. What happened on 9-11 is fundamentally important in its own right, but equally important is the way the 9-11 cover-up signifies an absence of democratic, transparent, and accountable government. Establishing the truth is, in part, about restoring honesty, trust, and confidence in the American political system. That is why 
On July 24th of this year, the Franklin Square and Munson Fire Department voted unanimously to adopt a legal resolution of support for the special federal grand jury investigation before the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York. <laughs> the almost 3,000 innocent people who were murdered right before our eyes that day cannot speak. So it is left up to us to speak for them and demand that their voices be heard in a court of law with subpoena power and an impartial jury to consider all the evidence by placing 9-11 under a microscope and investigating everything and anything with the same veracity as the recent Mueller investigation into Russian collusion. And, and not before some so-called commission of political appointees who had the rules dictated to them by some of the very people who were being investigated or who had conflicts of interests and which should have led to several members of the commission to recuse themselves. I demand to know, as should everyone, why was this important testimony limited and in some cases not even recorded? Why was crucial evidence suppressed or not even considered and looked at, or worse yet, destroyed? That is not justice. To put 9-11 into a little perspective, I looked at the cost of government investigations and money spent. The Mueller investigation cost about $25 million. The Whitewater investigation cost about 60 to $70 million. The Space Shuttle Challenger disaster, it cost about $175 million and seven astronauts killed. The Space Shuttle Columbia disaster cost about $400 million and seven astronauts killed. The 9-11 Commission was initially given $3 million and 18 months to complete with a final cost of about $15 million and a conclusion that it was a failure of imagination. Really, imagine that the worst act of terrorism in the history of our country, which claimed almost 3,000 innocent lives and which dramatically altered the course of our nation and the world, and it had an imposed deadline of just 18 months, which was extended by two months, and it had an initial budget of just $3 million. Remember what the chairman and vice chairman of 9-11 Commission said. They were set up to fail and were starved of funds to do a proper investigation. Who could have imagined that, given the magnitude of such an atrocity? People lie, but the facts don't. All we want now, after 18 years, is the truth, based on the facts that can be proved in a court of law. Throughout history, it has been the inaction of those who could have acted, the indifference of those who should have known better, and the silence of the voice of justice when it mattered most that has made it possible for evil to triumph. So it would seem now, until now, we have left unmolested those who set the fire to the house and prosecuted those who sounded the alarm, but that is changing. Justice consists, consists not in being neutral between right and wrong, but in finding out the right and upholding it wherever found against wrong. Theodore Roosevelt. Justice will not be served until those who are unaffected are as outraged as those who are. Benjamin Franklin. And for all of you who have been toiling away in the kitchen, where's Richard Gage? Toiling away in the kitchen for these past 18 years, Confucius said, the man who moves a mountain begins by carrying away small stones. Thank you.
right? That was a wonderful talk. Our next speaker is, uh, needs no introduction. He's the most prolific presenter of 9-11 evidence at Ground Zero of New York City in the world. He's a architect for over 30 years, like to introduce, and the, the founder and president of Architects for Engineers for 9-11 Truth. He will also be, uh, during his talk, he'll be Skyping someone in or Zooming someone in from Switzerland or from Germany, and he'll tell, tell you about that. I'd like to introduce Richard Gage. Thank you. I am truly humbled. <laughs> Was that not like the best 9-11 yeah. delivery that you've ever heard? How can we go wrong now with voices and powerful people like that behind us? How about it? Yeah. So let's get some justice. And for some of us, it starts fairly simply with a skyscraper called World Trade Center Building 7. So how many of you know about Building 7? OK. Sorry. <laughs> Wrong place. How many of you don't know about Building 7? Not much about it. You heard a few things. There are some people in the room. This is fantastic. You are the audience, because all of us know a whole hell of a lot of people that don't know anything about Building 7. We start there, why? Because no plane hit that building. Theoretically, according to the official story, nobody died in that building. And yet, it comes down really fast in the afternoon of 9-11. So we have 3,000 architects and engineers demanding a new investigation. This building was 47 stories tall, easily the tallest building in most of our states. So if you're already familiar with some of these talking points, please get familiar with the rest of them so that you can deliver this message as simply as can be, as I will be delivering it. It's part of the World Trade Center. It was built in the 80s. It's 100 feet from the World Trade Center North Tower. Here it is standing, tall. A few beams hit it from the World Trade Center, but NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, says this was not a factor, a significant factor, in the collapse of this building. So what was? Let's first look at the building collapse. Here it is standing, just fine, but 5.20 in the afternoon, the East Penthouse goes down, and then, Six seconds later, this happens. Whoa, stop, stop everything. I think I've seen this before, right? The old hotels in Las Vegas. What does NIST say about this? Oh, it came down due to normal office fires. Wait a minute, no skyscraper has ever collapsed due to normal office fires. Let's look at them. Well. These look like normal office fires. These are the largest fires we have photographic or video evidence of, though. They're few, they're small, and they're scattered. NIST says, well, these fires were raging on this floor 13 and 12 at the time of the collapse. Well, that turns out to not be true. Those fires were out, according to the photographic and video evidence, more than an hour before the collapse. NIST focuses their initiation of collapse theory on column 79, which is this column here, because they say, well, these fires that were raging at the time of the collapse heated up these 50-foot long beams that you see running left to right, pushed this girder off of its seat on this column 79, 
And that allowed the 13th floor to fall, the 12th to 12th on the 11th, and so on for nine floors, uh, weakening that column's bracing so that it just collapsed. And then the whole thing just collapsed. Again, the photographs and the videos show no fire burning for the hour before this collapse. Completely pulls the rug out from under them, which is only one of 12 rugs they have hid their evidence or their assumptions under. Not the least of which that there is no precedent for a collapse of a high rise steel frame skyscraper prior to 9-11. And there is a precedent for something else bringing down skyscrapers. What is it? It's called controlled demolition. And we have thousands or hundreds of examples from all across the country to make our comparison to Building 7. This is the most common way to bring down these buildings. They put shaped cutter charges in the columns and beams in the building, and they can bring it down quite effectively, as you see. So there are a set of features associated with controlled demolition. What are they? A sudden onset. Do we have a sudden onset of this building's collapse? Let's look and see. It's standing just fine. The East Penthouse goes down six seconds later. The entire building drops suddenly. Do we have a straight down symmetrical collapse? Well, let's look from West Street. Pretty straight down, pretty symmetrical. And the entire penthouse after the East Penthouse falls drops a half a second prior to the overall building. What does that mean? Well, that completely pulls the rug out from this theory that this collapse started on the east and then traveled uniformly across this building in just about 10 seconds. So this proves that that didn't happen. This alone, the video proves that the columns had to have been taken out all at once in the core, followed a half a second later by the perimeter columns. And so we have some more backup to that story from one of the top forensic structural engineers in the country who will explain how this building could possibly end up in the middle of the footprint in a haystack pile. Maybe we're not quite convinced yet on the left, building seven on the right, a series of controlled demolitions. Is there any similarity? Is there enough similarity to warrant an investigation into the possible use of explosives? especially since it looks exactly like a controlled demolition, especially since fire, the official cause of this building's collapse, has never brought down a skyscraper ever before 9-11. How do we do that? We have to remove those columns. Hey, there's 82 columns on each floor. And they have to be removed virtually all at once on at least eight floors. And I'll explain that in a minute. That's six hundred columns being removed virtually at once. Can the few small scattered fires that we've seen accomplish that? It's a very serious question. We're talking about these fires. Can they do that? I don't think so. 3,000 architects and engineers don't think so. The University of Alaska doesn't think so. The fire commissioners from the Munson Fire District don't think so. Physicists don't no, think so, true. who have blocked this collapse at free fall acceleration for a third of its seven second fall. It's as fast as a bowling ball falling out of the sky. It's as if eight stories were instantly removed. Again, can fire do that? And result in the total dismemberment of the structural steel system where columns and beams in a moment resisting structural steel frame are rigidly welded to each other. We wouldn't expect it to fall like a house of cards in six seconds. Buildings that fall naturally, we can see the building at the bottom, right? It's not, the columns and beams are not severed one from another. The concrete is not pulverized to a fine powder. We don't have witnesses that hear sounds of explosions and see flashes of light. Oh, no evidence for explosives found, says Sham Sunder of the NIST report, the National Institute of, uh, Institute of Standards and Technology, who was tasked by Congress to explain this collapse to the American people. 
Well, there are some witnesses. Here's Kevin McPadden, former Air Force medic. He says, I know an explosion when I see it. It's like, I'll go boom, like you wanted to grab onto something. Barry Jennings, along with Michael Hess, the building had been evacuated after the towers were hit by the planes. But before the towers came down, they're, getting, they're trying to get to the 23rd floor, wondering where is everybody? On their way up, they get blown around in the building. On their way down, they get blow, blown around in the building. And they see all these explosions. He said he's walking over dead bodies. Fascinating. Uh, it, it completely betrays the official story. There are many witnesses of explosions. These firefighters are among them. Where you hear in this video, which you can see on our DVD, 9-11 explosive evidence, experts speak out. Hold up that DVD, Gail, would you? Uh, we have a lot of great information for you. And we have a few of them uh, for you as well. The best uh, DVD on the 9-11 forensic evidence that you've seen. Um, how about what do the experts say? Uh, well, here's one of the top forensic, uh, one of the top controlled demolition experts in the country, uh, in Europe, uh, Danny Juenko. It starts from below. They've simply blown away the columns. It's a controlled demolition. A team of experts did this. Professional work, without a doubt. Now, this is unbiased uh, experts. The controlled demolition industry experts in our country are beholden to the federal government which might sway through political or financial obligations, their objective opinion. But not so for 100 structural engineers sign on to the petition at AE 911 Truth, like Kamal Obey, a localized failure in a steel frame building like World Trade Center 7 cannot cause a catastrophic collapse like a house of cards without a simultaneous and patterned loss of several of its columns at key locations within the building. Many, many other quotes. Not time today, I just have about 10 more minutes, so we're gonna go through it. But I want you to know that these mysterious construction workers walking away from Building 7, the afternoon of 9-11, hearing an explosion over their shoulder, looking back at the building, and then looking straight into the CNN camera and saying, what you can't hear today because of our sound issues, uh, did you hear that? The building's coming down, flame and debris coming down. The building's gonna blow up. Well, why is the building blowing up when it has a few small scattered fires? It's an unprecedented event that the building actually came down. Well, they were told that it had structural damage and it was gonna come down. Uh, that's a lot different than the, than the building blowing up and all of these witnesses like Kevin McPadden, uh, who earlier was talking about explosions. He's held six blocks away from the building and he's listening to a radio held in the hand of a Red Cross worker and he hears uh, a three, two, one. <laughs> and then, the, and then the, he, he feels those explosions under his feet that uh, make him want to grab onto something. So uh, again, you've, you've got you've to look at the DVD to get the gravity of these witnesses, including Jane Stanley of the BBC, who announced 20 minutes before it ever happened, the unprecedented collapse of a steel frame building by weakening. They actually give us the reason, weakening when the structural towers went down. This is extraordinary. I mean, there's the building right behind her. They apologize for this grievous error, citing the confusing events of the day. What, does this make them psychic? Well, <clears throat> in a one hour's time, lot more than we have here today, you can learn all of the 10 key characteristic features, including uh, extreme heat, molten incendiary, uh, proof of incendiaries, molten metal, uh, iron and steel melting, uh, freely flying, uh, rapid, uh, rapid, uh, rapidly ejected, laterally uh, ejected structural steel sections out of the towers, and uh, persistent extreme heat, not accountable by normal office fires whatsoever. It's all direct evidence of explosives. Fire does not create these features with additional circumstantial corroborative testimony. Uh, we, uh, the two, 3,000 now, architects and engineers uh, demanding an, a new 9-11 investigation now, along with the unanimous resolution passed 
by the brave fire commissioners at the Franklin Square Munson Fire District uh, who lost one of their own. <laughs> He didn't say this today, but he said it before. You better believe that when the entire service of New York State is on board, we will be an unstoppable force. <laughs> what else is making us unstoppable? One of the top forensic structural engineers in the country, Professor Leroy Hulsey, a chairperson of the Civil Engineering Department, University of Alaska Fairbanks, uh, got a hold of, well, we got a hold of him one of our members and repeatedly asked him, he denied it first. He said, no, man, I, I, I don't want to take this on, but he looked at it and he's uh, saying, oh, gosh, we got a problem. No other tall steel frame building has collapsed due to fire. Um, maybe we should look at it because we have lots of tall steel frame buildings similarly built that could collapse due to fire also. It has to be understood. So he examines the response to the fire loads he rules out scenarios that couldn't cause the collapse. Uh, the, the goal here to identify types of failures and locations that could have caused the collapse and, and uh, contributed to the observable collapse. He has input data that is transparently observable by all, unlike NIST, who withheld their computer input data from their uh, 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 secret report uh, citing that it might jeopardize public safety. Well, wait a minute. How could it jeopardize public safety to withhold from the architects and engineers who were tasked with ensuring the public safety uh, this valuable information so we can make sure our buildings are safe? So uh, he, he simulates a local structural response to fire loading as NIST did in floor 13 using their uh, assumptions. He examines uh, those assumptions and the initiation uh, of collapse theory by NIST. He simulates uh, numerous fire failure scenarios uh, that NIST had put forth, identifying what would lead to the total collapse. So there's an extraordinary series of drawings that are available in the 128 page report, which you can download from our website now, ae911truth.org, in a report that's really going to change the landscape of architectural and engineering most of whom, again, are completely unaware of the destruction, the third worst structural failure in modern history. And I'm particularly architects uh, who have not received one bulletin on this collapse from our institute of 80,000 members, of which I'm a member. We're just shocked when we go out and we find that most of them are completely uninformed. So the modeling also uh, reveals here that uh, one of the uh, results of NIST, they made the right exterior structure, for instance, infinitely stiff. So all of the heat expansion would move all of those elements to the left, pushing that girder off of its seat. And the girder had shear studs. It couldn't have been pushed off of its seat, but they ignore those shear studs. The girder had stiffeners. They ignore those stiffeners. And, they, and the movement goes to the left. But what does Professor Halsey find when he transparently with accurate data, uh, the, it doesn't do that. The, the stiff part of this building is at the elevator core. It's moving that Boeing out that exterior steel frame. On and on and on, he disproves one assumption after another by NIST, including the fact that even if that girder did heat up, it would expand and get trapped behind the side plate that is welded onto this wide flange column 79. The 13th floor couldn't have busted the broken by sheer force, the 12th floor, even if it did fall, there never would have been a progressive collapse. So what are these findings? Well, they overestimated the exterior wall rigidity. The exterior walls were flexible, not stiff. And the movement of the seat was in the opposite direction, as we just talked about. The NIST assumptions are that the shear connections weren't there, but they were there. They assumed that they were broken, but they couldn't have been. Uh, NIST assumed the bolts fastening the girder to its seats uh, were, were broken. Uh, and NIST uh, assumes that uh, columns 79, 80, and 81 failed 
and an internal cascading collapse uh, on the east side. But what is found here is that they didn't fail. Even if you use all of NIST's incorrect, invalid assumptions, he can't get the building to fail at all. So he does something extraordinary. He takes out more columns, like eight of them. What happens when he does that? Well, gosh, you take out eight of those columns and all of a sudden the building does begin to fail, but it tips over. Looks nothing like the collapse that you just saw. So what does he do next? He says, gosh, how do we get this building to fail like the video shows? Well, let's see. Here's the computer model. What did he have to do in order to facilitate this? An isolated series of removal of columns under the East Penthouse, a separate event. And then removing 600 columns all at once. By God, the building comes down at free fall acceleration. So what are the essential findings? Fire did not cause the collapse of this building. The temperatures were not hot enough to cause weakening of the structural steel. Thermal expansion did not result in the loss of support of the beams and girders. The, the, the building did not experience a progressive collapse as claimed by NIST. It was actually a global collapse caused by the near simultaneous failure of its columns, 600 of them. And so that's why we have uh, the, the comparison side by side where you see NIST on the right, their computer model, which proves their theory, but stops just two seconds after it starts, after it begins to crumple up like a beer can, looking nothing like the video of the collapse in the middle and showing 400 structural steel connections failing every second. Uh, and they still can't get it to behave like like the University of Alaska did. Yes, the, the Professor Halsey's model is indeed uh, mimicking exactly what's going on in the building. And that's why we have 3,000 architects and engineers. And that's why we want you to show this to every architect and engineer you can find, everybody else that you know. Uh, because then people are open to the World Trade Center towers, and which exhibit, by the way, all 10 key characteristic and very uncharacteristic features of controlled demolition, direct evidence by explosives. Again, fire not creating these features, uh, particularly the near free fall acceleration of these buildings. Uh, so I want to show you how fast these buildings come down. Here's five seconds, se seven seconds. In about a dozen seconds, both of these towers are completely shattered their structure from top to bottom. And through what? Through the incredible steel structure, which is mostly steel. There's more steel on this facade than glass. And that's why we have this German uh, uh, mathematician who has a master of science in physics and a PhD in math who is been invited in New York to come to this country to speak on this subject. And since he couldn't or hasn't yet been able to do that, uh, we're, we're going to invite him here right now. <laughs> Ansgar. Well, can you hear Ansgar me? Ansgar Schneider is, um, he'll be speaking about the collapse of the North Tower and about what can be learned from the physics with NIST's assumption of a progressive floor collapse. Unfortunately, he can't join us, uh, but uh, because our, our, uh, the US authorities have refused his entry uh, into our country, but we have accepted his entry here. Let's give him a big hand. Uh, so uh, good day, everybody. I'm not sure. Can you hear me? OK, very good. Uh, so we, we made a trial for my presentation, but I'm not sure whether actually I, uh, I'm able to repeat that. Uh, so you can't see my presentation. So how do I get that again? Um, so go ahead and share that, Ansgar. Um, so yeah, I will talk about the collapse of the North Tower. Um, you probably uh, have seen it 100,000 times how the North Tower collapsed. 
So the North Tower is the two of the twin, one of the twin towers with the uh, with this large antenna on top. Here you see it from the southwest, and here you see it uh, from the northeast. Um, so I'm going to show you a clip, and I want to note that in the beginning, in the first seconds of the clip, you can see the roof line, and then later on you can still see the crushing front. So here you see the roof line, and here you see the uh, crushing front moving down. So these two observations uh, will be important later. So I will now explain a physical model of what might have happened to this building. Namely, we assume that the collapse of the building followed a progressive floor collapse. And I will try to explain what that means. So here you see a sketch of the building. Um, so these uh, grays, uh, uh, horizontal lines, uh, bars here are the four slabs, and you see the uh, columns uh, indicated here. So one story had approximately a height of 3.8 meters, and uh, presentation goes on. Oh yeah. So um, so we assume that there's one story which is uh, so much weakened because of the aircraft impact or because of the fires uh, that it can't stand the weight anymore. So this story collapses. And then the top section impacts this lower floor here. And then the floor below, the story below also collapses and so on and so forth. So we, we assume that this behavior happened to this building. It's an assumption. And uh, you can then describe this physical behavior and analyze the geometry of this. So while the building is collapsing, you have three parts of the building. The top section, which we assume is undestroyed, and the middle section, which is increasing in height as the crushing front moves down and progresses. And then there is this remaining still intact bottom section, which is decreasing in height as the crushing front moves down. So the amount of how much this middle section here is compacted is uh, specified by a numerical parameter, which I call compaction parameter. And you might think of this as approximately 15%. So that means that if the story of uh, well, a certain height, 3.8 meters, uh, that the story is squeezed up to 15% of its original height after the crushing front has passed by. So then we also assume that th this, this top section and this middle section, they move together downward with the same velocity. And having said all this, you can then formulate a mathematical model for, from out of this geometry and about from the, from the moving mass, which uh, is essentially very simple, as you can see. It's, uh, it's, it's just a formulation of classical Newtonian mechanics. I won't comment further on this right now. You can look it up in the papers if you like. I want to emphasize the following. So this mathematical equation, this is a tool to do something. And what, what I can do with this equation is what I can compute the resistance force of the structure while the building collapses from the movement of the falling section. So once I know the, the movement of the section, I can compute the resistance force. So if the movement is getting faster, then you can conclude that there is little resistance. And if the move, movement is getting slower, then you can conclude that there is a lot of resistance. So what we have to do is we have to investigate the movement of the building. And uh, how we can do that. So here are uh, four stills from a video taken from the north side of uh, uh, the, the, the building. So you see the north side, it's taken from the north at uh, four distinct times. And here you can see I tracked the roof line uh, in this last, in this fourth picture, you see this blue line here, and that is um, keeping track of the antenna. So if the blue line were not here, you could see here the last bit of the antenna before it disappears behind the dust cloud. So you can still 
uh, determine the position of the roof line, which is here. And so you can evaluate all this, all this, and then you get um, certain numbers for the elevation uh, of the roof line. And you can then turn this and couple this with the mathematical model, which I earlier wrote down. And uh, so here you see these horizontal lines. These are the measurements which I showed you. And in the middle of these lines, which is not like uh, drawn here, is the, the actual empirical value. So these are the error bars. So the, the, the roof line is somewhere between these error bars. So this is uh, this in the, the, the here you see it indicated the height of the tower top, and this is time, of course. So then these colored graphs indicate the movement of the roof line as computed by the physical model. So these are not measured data; these are the phys these these are data from the physical model, and it's it's uh, indicated here for four different upward forces. And uh, I want to emphasize here the red graph, the 250 megajoules solution. So that means an energy of 250 megajoules was dissipated during the construction of a story. So the, upward, the average upward force is this energy divided by the story height. And uh, so a similar result has been obtained by Bajand and others in 2008 already. And what they conclude is that as you see here, the collapse continues. So they conclude that the, the building's strength, the resistance force of the building was too weak to arrest the collapse as soon as it had started. But this conclusion is false because they miss certain observation, which I show you now. You can, oh, sorry. So you can evaluate the position of the crushing front at later stages. So this right uh, photograph here, this right still is from the video which I showed you in the very beginning. This still here is from another video which I didn't show you in the beginning. But you can trace the crushing front, the movement of the crushing front at these times indicated, 7.7 .7 seconds and 9.25 seconds. And then you have to work a little bit and then you can determine the height of the crushing front, the elevation of a concourse level. And with these data, then, you can go back into the, uh, the numerical uh, solution and you find the following diagram. So here you see these three upper error bars are the error bars, as I have sh shown you before. And here, this is, again, the 250 megajoule solution. And you see that these other two empirical values, which are the, these two bottom horizontal lines, uh, that at this time here, 7.7 .7 seconds, the computed solution from the physical model precedes the empirical value by 40 meters approximately. So this means that in the time interval between 4.5 seconds and 7.7 .7 seconds, there was a tremendous deceleration of the top section. So you see this red graph, the curve, the curving of the red graph is towards, is, is downward. And here you see the curving is, uh, so to say, upwards. And this means here, the movement is decelerating. And you can compute how much the movement, uh, how, how, how big the force is that, uh, that, that, that takes place to decelerate the top section so much. So here in this diagram, the computation has been done where I turn on the force here at 4.5 seconds, and I stop the force here at 7.7 .7 seconds. But if I would not turn off the force here, then you would find that uh, the fall of the building would actually arrest. So here, there is no downward movement visible anymore in this diagram. So I didn't turn off the force. In the, the talking about the blue graph here in the right diagram. So um, this this violet graph is not of any importance here. Actually, it's just for comparison. So the the blue graph is uh, the important one. So the sum of these two values here, this uh, 1,700 and 250 is approximately 2,000. And the conclusion here is that if we assume that the building collapsed in a gravity-driven progressive floor collapse, then we can conclude that um, the possible resistance force of the structure was on a scale of 2,000 megajoules per story, which is the sum of these two 
values here in, in this middle interval, in this uh, middle time interval. And uh, we also see that uh, the uh, structure of uh, the resistance force was very far below this possible value in the time interval before and in the time interval after this middle, uh, uh, this middle time interval. So we, we conclude that in these two time intervals, somehow the, the building structure was reduced. And uh, the model doesn't tell you which phenomenon reduced the building, uh, the, the structural force, but I can uh, observe that this was the case. So, Excellent. Um, thank you so much, Ansgar. This yeah. is awesome. Um, I, do you want to make uh, one closing statement and we'll be able to uh, uh, move on with the, uh, we're, we're getting the news over here. Yeah, so, uh, well, I mean, the, the conclusion is um, we, we have to find this unknown phenomenon, which could possibly, could have possibly reduced the structural force, uh, the, the resistance force. And uh, to my knowledge, there's only one explanation that is active human intervention. So. Um, <laughs> Very well put. That was, that was polite. Gail, could you uh, hold up the DVD that shows active human intervention uh, at the Twin Towers? Uh, any one of them. <laughs> we have a lot of uh, sources there for you. Ansgar, a big hand for Ansgar. Thank you so much. Awesome. Now, Ansgar has been invited uh, by the International Association of Bridge and Structural Engineering to give this paper. They accepted him and yet he couldn't get into the country. He's hoping still, aren't you, Ansgar, to give this presentation uh, by Skype to the uh, association this week or next week? Yeah, it was. Uh, so the, this uh, slightly um, different version of this presentation was shown at the conference. So uh, oh, it on was Thursday. fantastic. On how Thursday, how yeah. was it received? Well, I don't know because it was, I mean, it was a record of presentation and uh, so I didn't, <laughs> I didn't have any contact with the audience, but it was shown in, uh, uh, in my session. Fantastic. It's Thanks so much again, Ansgar. Big hand. <laughs> All right. Going to jump back now. Uh, and um, that was Ansgar Schneider. And guess what? The evidence shows on the table. 9-11 uh, explosive evidence experts speak out all 10 key characteristic and uncharacteristic features of controlled demolition. And so these are the, uh, the resources that you have over here so that we can get to the bottom uh, of the truth about what happened on 9-11, what really happened. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard Gage. Our next speaker, Mick Harrison, is the litigation director of the Lawyers Committee for 9-11 Inquiry. And when I mentioned that we just submitted a new grand jury petition, well, uh, Mick is uh, very instrumental in putting that together. He is a public interest lawyer for 27 years, experiencing uh, litigating whistleblowing protection, environmental enforcement, constitutional rights, Native American rights, federal false claims rights. And uh, if you're talking about people's freedom, mix the guy, we're honored that he's with the Lawyers Committee and our litigation director, I want to present Mick Harrison from Indiana. Good afternoon, folks. Uh, David asked me to give you a the short version of what legal actions we have in progress to build on this evidence you've been hearing about. So is this any better? Okay, maybe my technical colleagues can help with the volume. So as a former teacher, I don't normally have this problem of projecting. So the short version is the Lawyers Committee has five active federal lawsuits at this time 
building on the evidence we're talking about. Three of them are Freedom of Information Act lawsuits to help obtain records still in the hands of the federal government that the public has not seen yet. One of those lawsuits is against the FBI, and I'll give you the details on that. And the other is the lawsuit that David just mentioned, which is the mandamus lawsuit to force the US attorney to provide all of this demolition evidence to a special grand jury. And so these lawsuits are progressing. They're in different stages. The FBI lawsuit uh, is regarding a commission that some of you may not know about. It's not the original 9-11 commission. It's regarding a later 9-11 review commission. And for those who don't know, that commission was mandated by Congress in 2013. It did its work in 2014 and 2015, issued a report in March 2015, and the Congress had ordered the FBI to do this new evaluation of all 9-11 evidence that had not been addressed by the original 9-11 Commission. And there was a lot of 9-11 evidence that was not addressed by the original 9-11 Commission. And all of the demolition evidence you've heard about today is among that evidence that was not addressed by the original 9-11 Commission. So how much of the demolition evidence did the new 9-11 Review Commission address? And the answer is zero. They didn't look at any of it. They didn't even acknowledge that the that body of evidence was out there. And there are a number of other categories of evidence that was not looked at by either commission. So the purpose of this lawsuit, currently in the US District Court in Washington, DC, is to get a court order directing the FBI to go back and do what Congress ordered them to do, which is to assess and report to Congress and thereby to all of us, all the 9-11 evidence not addressed by the original 9-11 Commission. And other categories briefly of that evidence, in addition to the controlled demolition evidence, there was a body of evidence regarding some individuals arrested on 9-11 under suspicious circumstances. The FBI calls them the high fivers. That evidence was not addressed by the new commission. The evidence of Saudi and other international financing for some of the alleged hijackers, not addressed by either commission. Uh, the evidence of the Pentagon uh, videos, which we have yet to see, from the Pentagon and the surrounding areas, uh, not addressed by either commission. The evidence of plane wreckage and parts recovered from the scenes of the three crashes. And you may, most of you have seen the pictures of the FBI walking in lines across these crash areas, picking up evidence, every scrap of evidence they could find. That evidence has yet to be evaluated by either commission or reported to Congress or the public. And the other category we've addressed at the moment has to do with phone calls reportedly made from the planes on 9-11. And there's an issue, some of you may know about that. The FBI gave one description of those calls to the 9-11 Commission and another description of those calls to a federal court in uh, the Masawi case. So that lawsuit is progressing and we'll let you know how that goes. We have an inkling of what the government's response is gonna be uh, they filed initially a motion to dismiss, arguing legal technicalities that we didn't have the standing to even raise the issue and that the congressional mandate wasn't really enforceable. Uh, we filed an amended complaint after that, which mooted their initial motion. So we'll be seeing that motion again shortly. The Freedom Information Act cases we have pending, one is against NIST and FEMA for all the building performance study data. And we actually acquired a lot of their records already because of that lawsuit, but there's more they're withholding. That case, the status of that case is uh, we filed summary judgment motion, so it's the government. We're expecting a decision any moment on that case. Um, and we'll let you know what happens on that. The government has basically um, taken the position that notwithstanding records that we have, that refer to these other records they have never provided that uh, they can't find the records that their own reports refer to. So we'll see how that works out. The second FOIA case is against NIST, uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology. Uh, we're trying to get the interviews that NIST investigators did uh, with first responders. And um, those have yet to see the light of day. We hope they will soon because of our lawsuit. 
And the third Freedom Information Act lawsuit is regarding column 79. You saw that mentioned by Richard. Column 79 is where NIST says the collapse of building seven started. And we're trying to get all the data regarding column 79, which we think will support the findings of the study by just released by um, Professor Halsey from Alaska. So that is a significant lawsuit as well. Uh, the last lawsuit I'll talk about today is our mandamus lawsuit. Mandamus basically has to do with enforcing a mandatory duty. You may not realize all of us as citizens have a right to sue a public official who fails to perform a mandatory duty. And the duty in this case uh, is the U.S. attorneys imposed by a federal statute, as David mentioned, to hand any evidence from any of us of a federal crime reported to a U.S. attorney over to a special grand jury. The U.S. attorney has no discretion about this. It is a mandatory duty, must do. So um, we did get an encouraging sign, as David mentioned, from the U.S. attorney in the Southern District here in a letter saying they would comply with this statute, but they gave no details about what steps they would take to comply. And so we still don't know whether our petition and all of its evidence of controlled demolition has been given to a special grand jury. It may have been given to a special grand jury and we're hoping for the best on that. But because the U.S. Attorney, and as David mentioned, we called uh, the Assistant U.S. Attorney, Michael Ferrara, who has the terrorism unit in the Southern District for the U.S. Attorney, and his position was because of federal rule six, criminal rule six, he couldn't disclose any details to us. And so we're stuck uh, having no way of knowing the status and not being inclined to be stuck. Uh, we brought this federal lawsuit asking for two things. First, we're asking for a disclosure uh, of certain records and information so that we can know that our petition evidence was actually handed to the special grand jury. If it was, uh, that lawsuit will be over. We'll have accomplished that goal of getting all this evidence you're hearing about in front of, you know, 16 to 23 regular citizens to decide how to investigate it. And we hope that that is happening as we speak. However, if we don't get that disclosure ordered, or if we get a disclosure, and the disclosure is the U.S. Attorney has not actually given our evidence to the grand jury, then we're asking for a court order that the U.S. Attorney be directed to give that evidence to a special grand jury. And so that lawsuit was filed um, yesterday and we had the good help of a New York attorney, John O'Kelly, who may be here in the audience. And I thank him for having the courage and integrity that not all members of my profession have had on this issue and we couldn't have done this without him. So thank you, John. Now, let me close um, to say that the evidence we presented of controlled demolition in these litigations is not just persuasive, it is, in our view as lawyers, dispositive, which means that the doubt has been removed about it. And a number of the categories of evidence standing alone are scientifically dispositive. Um, and what that means is that they've eliminated all other potential explanations other than the use of explosives. And as Arthur Conan Doyle has said through his character, Sherlock Holmes, when you've eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. And that's where we're at on the controlled demolition issue. And we hope the courts at some point will come to grips with that. Now, uh, a lot of my colleagues aren't here, or they're in various parts of the country and the world at the moment. And, um, but, but we have a number of strong motivations for continuing our work. And I wanna share one of them uh, with you because it's related to the uh, historic actions we've heard about from Commissioner Joya and his colleagues. And that is, if you, if you watch the video record of what happened on 9-11, you'll, you'll observe that one of the firefighters made his way up pretty high up in one of the towers. And he reported back that the fires were, you know, there weren't that many fires, they weren't that bad. A couple, a couple lines, a couple hoses could knock them down. And shortly thereafter, and I do mean shortly thereafter, that building collapsed. And now that we know from this evidence that there were explosives placed in that, in the buildings, that means that whoever triggered those explosives, triggered those explosives at a time that they knew 
that these courageous selfless firefighters and first responders were in that building and that they were going to be killed when they triggered those explosives and they did that knowingly and you know you have to sort of let that sink in and so that is one of the motivations for me and why we're not going to stop until we do get transparency and accountability on 9-11. Thank you very much. Okay, that was Mick Harrison, litigation director for the Lawyers Committee for 9-11 Inquiry. We're gonna take a short break, or you can stretch up, use the bathrooms out there, but in a few minutes, when you hear the bagpipes, in five minutes, the bagpipes that we play, and that means we're ready to, to Skype in, Zoom in, Kurt Wiebe from Maryland, whistleblower from the NSA, okay? So be five minutes, thank you. Okay, we're gonna start up, we're gonna have, uh, Zoom in to the conference. Uh, Kurt Wiebe. Kurt grew up in northern Indiana next to the shores of Lake Michigan. He spent four years of duty in Turkey and Japan with the intelligence arm of the United States Air Force from 1963 to 1967. Uh, in 1964, he got a master's degree in Russian language. And then after that, he started in the NSA. He led a team at that time when he was in the NSA of analysts, and they were cited uh, for their meritorious civilian service award by the CIA. Uh, he has, uh, since retiring in 2001, he re retired in October 31st, 2001, he joined uh, Bill Binney and Ed Loomis, and they started a consulting business uh, and mentioning Bill Binney, Bill Binney originally was going to be here. Uh, Bill Binney is a great American. Uh, they did a, a movie on him called The Good American. And uh, his real good That's buddy him. and friend is Kurt Wiebe. And they're former, they're both uh, fellow whistleblowers and both NSA uh, officers and National Security Administration officers. I see, I don't now, see, uh, I see a mic. It says. Now, Bill Binney. And Ed Loomis and Kurt right, just they started a business. Okay. And in oh, 2002, uh, when uh, the NSA was moving in the wrong direction, uh, they uh, met a woman named Diana Rourke from the, uh, the House Select Committee on Intelligence. And they made a complaint about the mismanagement of waste of hundreds of millions of dollars and the illegal surveillance that NSA was doing of all American citizens. Now they talked to two congressmen about it who were connected to the House Select Committee of Intelligence and they sent a letter to the Supreme, to the Justice, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court and uh, asking for accountability for the NSA, and they got no response except uh, being uh, basically persecuted by the government. Uh, they are advocate, advocates for legislation to rein in the NSA's violations of all of our rights, our United States Constitution rights. And they, he's, he's appeared, this is Kurt, on CBS, 60 Minutes, PBS Frontline, Fox News Channel, Sh Sean Hannity, Megyn Kelly, Neil Cavuto Show, and uh, I'd like to introduce to you from Maryland, another good American and a great patriot, Kurt Wiebe. Fire when ready, Kirk. Okay, uh, good afternoon to all the viewers and those in attendance, and God bless the victims of 9-11 and their families. None of you can imagine the horror that went through my heart and mind on that tragic day, and I knew it could have been prevented. What? 
What caused that not to be prevented? Human ego, arrogance, people that thought they knew more and they didn't. People more concerned with big budgets than mission accomplishment. The same old follies that man always fails at. There's no new paradigm here. It's the same old problem. Unfortunately, the government has a responsibility to protect its citizens, not to mismanage the efforts designed to do that. I want you to know that Bill Binney, my colleague, close friend, had quadruple bypass surgery last week, and he's doing absolutely wonderfully. In fact, I probably rushed it a little bit when I asked Bill yesterday if he would join me in going out for a drive and maybe we'd stop somewhere and get a bite to eat. He was desperate to get out. As you know, you come out of a hospital, um, you don't get much sleep because they're always prodding you and asking questions. So when he got home, he, the first day, he slept like a baby. But then after a couple of days, you know, he started getting restless. And, and it's amazing the technology in open heart surgery and how they minimize pain and uh, the, the whole procedure. And I just uh, salute the doctors at University of Maryland Hospital in Baltimore, who also put two stents in my heart. So I appreciate what they do on both counts. Anyway, I picked up Bill. He said, let's go. And he carefully uh, pushed him out in the wheelchair and he carefully got into the front seat. And I said, Bill, how do you feel? You know, and I have visions of wire holding his chest cage together at the sternum. And uh, he says, eh, it's a little uh, sore, but I'm okay. And he, you know, he's a double amputee at, uh, just below the knee. And he swung his uh, legs in and fastened his uh, safety belt and we were off to the Olive Garden. And that's not an advertisement, it was just a convenient place to go. <laughs> so anyway, he enjoyed uh, a nice Italian meal and we talked at some length about current problems. You know, problems keep coming. So I'm not gonna go into those, except to say we are now very focused on trying to secure the integrity of the elections process in the United States. And I'm talking about the equipment and the process that must be guarded and secured to make people's vote count. So keep track of that if you, if you can. Anyway, uh, Bill said, uh, all right, let's go out. I wanna go over here and uh, visit some place, uh, a store or something. And, uh, we did that briefly, and then we went back uh, on the way towards his house, and he says, Kirk, I got a, a taste for a hamburger. So I took him to McDonald's. He said, order me a vanilla milkshake and a cheeseburger. Within 30 minutes, he regretted that decision. Um, a little uh, GI upset, let's say. Too much rich food, too quickly, too soon. So he won't be doing that again for a while. So on to 9-11 and um, the purpose of our, our visit here today. Eight months before 9-11, a full eight months, Bill approached the analysis office for the Middle East. We knew terrorism was brewing. We knew there was a threat, albeit somewhat generalized. We didn't have specifics. And Bill knew, we knew, that the key would be to detect communications about any intention to attack the United States. In fact, that's NSA's mission. Foreign intelligence for threats designed to attack the United States, its allies, or assets abroad. So Bill said, we have this new capability that can go on the internet and pull meaningful data from it quickly. But we need to know where 
in the world we should put this device. So please look into your knowledge base and guide us. Bill came out of that meeting with nine sites. I'm not at liberty to say what they were, but there were nine. Management said, how much will it cost you to deploy this? And I think we said $1.9 million, not big dollars. And so we tried to make plans to deploy it to those nine sites and management wouldn't let us do it. Now, imagine the shock of having a tool, a capability to put into the fight on terror and being told you cannot use it. And we couldn't figure out why. Later on in a meeting, when we were still trying to push this solution to get out uh, in, into the toolbox of NSA, we invited the deputy director of NSA down to see the breakthroughs we had made, the technical breakthroughs that allowed us to select data very carefully from the internet. And that's a tough chore. It's like trying to sip from a fire hose. Lots of data. How do you pull out just what you need and not collect unnecessary data like the private data of innocent Americans, indeed innocent people globally? The more you collect innocent people, the more that data gets in the way of finding the real threat. And we understood that from the dynamics of studying the internet and the difficulties that it posed. So we invited deputy director down thinking for sure he will back the general adoption of the technology. When he saw the briefing, it only took about 15 minutes, he said, my God, you guys have made major breakthroughs. Why are you being so quiet? We weren't being quiet. We were being opposed from within by management, by other te technical offices. There's a, there's a great, there's a bad culture in government agencies where competition, the wrong kind, I need to be in the limelight, you need to be in the dark shadows, that kind of thing, rather than focusing on the technologies and the solutions that offer the most promise for mission accomplishment. That basically took us down. There was one more factor that prevented us from succeeding. When the deputy director told the director, Michael V. Hayden, Lieutenant General, United States Air Force, what he had seen, he essentially told Bill Black, the then deputy director, to shut up that we, he had been arguing and pleading in front of Congress for a budget of some $4 billion to modernize NSA, and that what we had developed would undermine that budget. Now, imagine that kind of rationale. What are we here to do? We're here to protect America, not build budgets unnecessarily to, to uh, satisfy the egos of general rank officers who always measure their career by the size of the budgets they command. So our solution called Thin Thread, and there were a couple other small programs attached to it that made it more useful for analysis and rapid discovery of threats. Um, the data access component was squashed and thrown out. And the director fielded a program called Trailblazer that cost billions of dollars. And that by 2005 was declared an utter failure. Now, let that sink in a minute. Not only did they thwart the deployment of the solution that could have prevented 9-11, but 
they did not field an alternative capability even after four and a half years. What does that mean in terms of loss of intelligence or intelligence opportunities missed? As you know, in the digital age, things change quickly. New communications capabilities come on, new social networks. You know the, the burgeoning, the blossoming of the internet and all the capabilities that came with it. This conferencing that we're doing right now, enabled by the internet. Um, things were growing at a tremendous rate. In fact, they say that an internet year, as opposed to a calendar year, is maybe uh, 3x because the speed of change is so rapid. At least it was at that time. So NSA lost tremendous volumes of intelligence as its targets also were moving from point-to-point -point communications, the old way of communicating, to packetized data communications. In other words, something called TCP IP or the internet. They were also jumping onto the internet and without a capability, NSA was actually going deaf. And I have to be honest with you, since retiring, I don't know where they are today. I pray some sensibilities have come to those in charge. But what I am most concerned about is the older I get and the more that time passes and the more we read in the news, we now find that surveillance capabilities were actually weaponized by an administration against another, a president-elect. And you know that investigation is ongoing right now. We are eager and we wish uh, Attorney General Barr and his prosecutor, John Dunham, all Godspeed and success because this attack on our form of government using intelligence tools that we played some role in developing at NSA when we were there is nothing more than a coup attempt. In fact, I noticed the news networks won't call it sedition. If you look under United States code, there's a law governing sedition and it defines, as it, defines it as any conspiracy that attempts to overthrow the United States government. My goodness, this is appearing to be a classic conspiracy. All the data is not in. But when it comes in, I think we are going to be shocked and see that we were threatened with the most serious threat to our form of government in this country's history. What that underlies is that there are people in government, people in society that are willing to throw the law out the window, completely out the window. You know, we find ourselves, uh, ourselves saying, how can so many people be, uh, be um, indicted, at least by circumstantial evidence, if not actual evidence, and go scot-free? Nothing happens to them. Justice is never realized. And so we have a problem in the country with corruption in various realms within government and society. Cheating, corruption has grown rampant. And I dare say all that is necessary for evil to succeed, quoting Edmund Burke, is for good men to do nothing. And I reach out to each of you again in memory of those who died on 9-11 and in recognition of the, of the tremendous hurt that their families have gone through, undescribable. I beg you to stand up, stand up, take a stand against corruption. And I think it'll improve our way of life here in this country. 
and I thank you very much for allowing me to talk to you today. Our next speaker is, is very well known in the 9-11 community. He lost a son in the North Tower. He's a stalwart, an inspiration to everyone that's been involved with 9-11. I'd like to introduce from, up, from Philadelphia, Bob McElvain. I'm really nervous now. I'm getting a lot of pr pressure from Richard here. I can't push buttons. And um, now I only have 10 minutes. I, I am nervous because I've gone over this. I, I wrote this a few years back. It takes just about 10 minutes. So please don't start the clock yet. Okay, Chris. <laughs> yeah. That thing comes up and you only have one minute. I'm about three minutes away. I get real nervous. So I am nervous. Okay. Hello, everyone. <laughs> what? Oh. oh. I decided to speak to you about my journey, utilizing a speech I gave a few years back on 9 11. Before I begin, I just wanted to mention a couple current facts. <laughs> That's what makes it so tough. I know. But you know, it's, I can practice this and practice this, but because I'm doing this so much, so long, it, you, you never get healed. It's, it's impossible to get healed. But yes, all right, I'll be, I'm fine. All right, as you, as you well aware, I, <laughs> I told him not to push any buttons. He's pushing all of our buttons tonight, isn't he? You're awesome, Bob. Uh, okay, don't push any buttons. <laughs> I broke my glasses on the way up, so I'm so afraid of breaking them again. All right, as you all are aware, we really lost a great literary icon, writer Toni Morrison. Bobby had a real connection with her. I can't believe how much I practiced this. All right, taking, taking every course of hers that he could while at Princeton. After Bobby died, she wrote to us, offering condolences and sending along a research paper of Bobby's that he had saved, that she had saved. My, well, my wife, Helen, of course, moved by this gesture, wrote to Miss Morrison, thanking her. Several months later, Helen found a copy of a very short, barely several lines long, autobiography Bobby had written as part of a work assignment. In it, Bobby listed Alan Iverson, great, great Philadelphia 76er, Tony Morrison, and my mother, or my mother, his mother, Helen, as, as his favorite people. My wife immediately got off another note to Ms. Morrison, attaching the bio and adding, just wanted to know how much Bobby thought of you. I'm so excited that I made the cut. As Bobby's father, I'm not sure where I stood, hopefully in the top 10. I'm bringing up Tony Morrison for another reason. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm afraid of these buttons. I'm bringing up Tony Morrison for another reason. Since her death, there has been much written about, about her, often accompanied by a quote, one I read recently got to me in simplicity. Tony Morrison wrote, if there's, a, if there's a book that you want to read, okay, but if it wasn't, hasn't been written yet, then you must write it. To me, it means that if there's something, <laughs> what the 
If there's something that needs to be written, Bert, something that needs solving, we don't wait for the other guy to look for the answers. We seek it ourselves. It's our responsibility to look for the truth, to embrace the task. Since 2001, the truth has not been written yet. It's our job, my job, to keep at it until it is. Right, connecting the dots of 9-11. Since Bobby's death of 9-11, I have been on a journey to find the truth and why, how and why he died and who really killed him. I was not satisfied from the beginning with the official story of his death. I also feared that violence around the world would escalate as a result of this horrendous act. In 2002, I joined the September 11th family for Peaceful Tomorrows, a group of activists whose name was inspired by a Martin Luther King statement, we are poor chisel, wars are poor chisels for carving out peaceful tomorrows. In the early part of the new decade, we marched hand in hand for peace in Washington and New York hoping that 9-11 would not be a justification for increased war efforts. I'll never forget the moment when we were arrested at the cap on the Capitol lawn, proudly carrying a banner stating, not my, my, I was carrying a banner stating, not my son's name, which referred to the use of 9-11 by Bush for further, for further war efforts. Later, at a conference of the, a World Conference on Victims of Violence in Bogota, Colombia. I told Bobby's story to a packed audience of survivors of various atrocities around the world. I was honored to have the opportunity to share my pain and grief with those who truly understood the price of violence. Back in the United States, I regularly attended 9-11 commission hearings, patient, patiently listening to testimony while hoping to find answers to an official story that continued to make little sense. Instead, I felt frustrated with the inability of the commission to discover anything new or enlightening. Witnesses, including Condoleezza Rice, were not accountable to the commission or the American people. Ms. Rice, to my dismay, filibustered her way through the entire commission. I returned home very discouraged. In 2005, on the 60th anniversary, of the atomic bombing, I was attacked, to, I, was asked, I was asked to join Peaceful Tomorrow's on a march from Nagasaki to Hiroshima, honoring those who had died in war. I walked beside the Hibakusha, survivors of the attack. They showed amazing pride, never taking the role of a victim, though many were treated as outcasts by their own people. The Hibakusha's courage impressed them to me in me the need to continue my quest for peace and truth. I returned home, deciding that the US government was not going to give me the real answers to 9-11. Then I'd find them myself. Why, I wonder, was, why was it so hard to go against the government's version of a story that did not make sense? I wanted to know why the media always seemed as far from a free press as one could imagine often ignoring obviously breakthroughs in information. Why also did peace seem either further away than before 9-11, frustrating the peace community? Our children died that horrible day and it was now being used as fodder for more escalation, more deaths. My quest for truth took me to both the traditional history sources as well as books written by outstanding authors who questioned the company line and sought deeper answers than what was offered in the news or in press conferences. As I searched, I recall quotes by Eisenhower, Kennedy, Roosevelt, and uh, President Wilson, initially read years ago by me when their dire warnings meant very little to a young college student studying history. Eisenhower in a famous speech in 1961 warned of the dangers of unwarranted influence, whether sought or un unsought by the military industrial complex. Kennedy later that year warned of a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covert means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice, on guerrillas by night instead of armies by day. 
Fascinated with these predictions by such stellar leaders, I began to probe further, seeing patterns, taking a harder look at the circumstances leading to the invasions of Iraq and Afghanistan. I looked farther back in history, reading about Operation Gladio and the Gulf of Tonkin in a different, more knowledgeable way or light. Was a 9-11 another false flag? I was beginning to see the truth. I wondered if presidents truly had any power to wage peace. Were special interest groups with unimaginable wealth and power, who were often referred to as a shadow government, controlling the decisions of war. After more continued research, I learned that these clandestine operatives would never allow control of a government to the people. They would instead rely on disinformation, weapons of mass disruption, a perfect example, fabrication of injustices, and the spreading of propaganda to justify their aggressive acts. Could these elite few be responsible for the upheaval in so many countries when it appeared to the general public that we were in those countries to promote democracy? As I continue my reading, I recall a quote from Joseph Goebbels, Hitler's propaganda minister. We tell, you tell a big lie enough and keep repeating it, people eventually come to believe it. He went on to say that the truth is the mortal enemy of the lie. And thus, by extension, the truth is the greatest enemy of the state. Sadly, I came to the conclusion best said by Woodrow Wilson, and unfortunately too true today. We have come to one of the worst ruled, one of the most completely controlled and dominated governments in the civilized world. No longer a government of free opinion, no longer a government by conviction and the vote of the majority, but a government by the opinion and duress of a small group of dominant men. From hours and hours of research, I've learned that the truth of 9-11, as well as the truth regarding who really holds the power in this country and throughout the world, are not in our best interest to know. According to those elite few who choose to control our destiny, unfortunately, peace and truth are not part of that destiny. Thank you. Thank you for it. Thank you. Our next uh, speaker, Gary Knoll, is going to be introduced by Les Jameson. Les is a good friend of Gary's, and Les is sort of the face of New York City 9-11 activism over many, many years. I'm going to give the podium here to Les Jameson to make that introduction. Thank you. Thank you. First, I have to acknowledge you all. You are quite diligent and persistent and uh, uh, have a lot of stamina here today. Congratulations. Has it been worth it so far? Pretty strong, right? Um, after doing these events for so many years, I must say this is uh, definitely uh, just at the pinnacle of quality and powerful information that is being delivered. Uh, and in terms of um, hours spent here, folks, I remember doing like four hours on a Friday night, 10 hours Saturday, another 10 on Sunday, more than once. So uh, we're, this is kind of um, a four hour short journey here. And uh, with that, I, I'm trying to make everybody feel really good, like uh, you're getting a, a great snapshot. So um, also I wanna ask, how many people are here as a result of uh, seeing the information on the Manhattan Neighborhood Network show of, by Joe Friendly called Truth for a Change? How many people? Here we go, he raised their hands, quite a few. Thank you, thank you. How many people have uh, heard the information on WBAI or Gary Null's program? Great, great. Anybody saw an advertisement in the Westview News? Great, awesome, awesome, thank you. Now, um, our next speaker has a very um, uh, profound task to, int to uh, introduce. Uh, he's an internationally renowned expert in the field of health and nutrition, 
PhD and author of over 70 best-selling books in the, on healthy living and the director of over 100 critically acclaimed full-featured documentary films on natural health, self-empowerment, and the environment. And throughout his career, Gary Null has made uh, hundreds of radio shows and television broadcasts throughout the country as an environmentalist, consumer advocate, investigative reporter, and nutrition educator. And I think what's uh, most profound for this audience, who uh, is also, by the way, uh, beyond this room through our live stream, uh, Gary is one of the most, most foremost presenters of hard-hitting investigative journalism in the areas of deep state and false flag uh, events and things that uh, uh, of this nature, which is just unfortunately not covered and needs to be covered in, in wider uh, areas of journalism. However, what's great to know is through Gary's journalism, he has developed a global audience numbering in the tens of millions. And, and Gary um, has always adhered to the highest standards of journalism, meaning that he challenges his presenters to only uh, present information that is of the highest quality, that is court admissible evidence. And uh, knowing that, I think it's profound also to point out that for many, many years, Gary has had one of the few shows that has put 9-11 truth and justice front and center. Okay. And for that, I, I really want to make a, a public uh, expression of thanks and, and gratitude on behalf of uh, advocates for 9-11 truth and justice worldwide. Thank you, Gary, for, for what you've done. Come on up. Thank you. Let me tell you what I'm not going to speak about. I'm not an architect. I'm not an engineer. Um, and I'm not going to talk about anyone who might have been behind the bringing down of these buildings, because I don't know that answer. What I do know is that virtually all of the materials that were presented in the official presentation are wrong. And that is my job as an investigative journalist, breaking over 200 original stories, including the politics of cancer. And, and uh, in the 1970s, we went after the cancer establishment. In the 1980s, we went after the AIDS establishment because they were profiteering off people suffering. So we deal with facts. And wherever the facts take me, that's the conclusions I come. I don't start with a conclusion and try to cherry pick facts to support it, as some people have. So as a result, I don't conjecture. I look, what can we prove? And we can prove that what they are telling us is the proof is false. But let them, the experts, the engineers, the people who are there, the first responders, let them give you their stories and have a new, as they're suggesting, a new committee or in a grand jury under oath, let the evidence come forward. What I'm gonna talk about is something completely different, but I think is relevant and foundational to everything you've been listening to. And that is, who do you believe? Are you familiar with the concept of telos? Yes. It's, it's a principle that goes back, clear back through Aristotle, that means what is the end game? What is it that you're trying to achieve? What is the purpose? What is the ideal that you're trying to discover? What truth are you looking for? In various forms, that's what it means. Now, we live in a very objectified world where people have individual truths versus universal truths. And here's the dynamic. Right now, you have the majority of people who believe that we were not told the truth about 9-11 are pretty much the same people who believe that we shouldn't have been in Iraq and we were lied to about weapons of mass destruction, who believes that Libya should not have been invaded because there was, no, there was no legitimate reason to invade Libya, who also believe that we should not have accepted that Syria was poisoning its own people, that we shouldn't have been in 
in Afghanistan, nor should we have been in Vietnam. So this isn't the first time that we have been told an official truth where there was evidence to challenge it, legitimate evidence. You've all heard of Edward Snowden. You've heard of William Binney. You've, you've heard of Chelsea Manning. Are you also familiar with Catherine Gunn, G-U-N? All of you? Okay. This shows why you should never, under any conditions, believe any government official unless they can prove le the legitimacy of their statements with prima facie documentation that would stand cross-examination in a trial. Now, Les was just stating, every article I've written, every article, I've never had to change a sentence. That's over 800 articles. Why? Because I have a lawyer that reviews every single statement, and if I can't prove my point I'm making, it doesn't get in the article. Therefore, you could use an article in a court of law versus someone's just opinion, and that's not what I give. Let me give an example of why you cannot believe anything you've been told officially about what happened on 9-11, and why you will not see any of the speakers here on this forum on CNN or on MSNBC, or Democracy Now!, or a lot of other places, or Mother Jones, or an article in The Nation. Because they, with their, and they have absolute right to do this, they choose which facts they want to accept and reject, what truths they're embracing and which truths they're rejecting. Back in 2003, working in the intelligence service in Great Britain was this young woman, she was in her mid-twenties, and uh, she, along with, I think it was 67 other employees that were there as analysts, they were analyzing phone calls from organizations around the world. They all received a uh, statement from a person from the National Security Agency. And what it said was, we want you to see if you can find compromising information that can be used as blackmail to get, I think it was seven or eight United Nations Security uh, Agency members to go along with an invasion because there were not enough votes to pass it under UN resolution. So it's a UN mandated war, which would have allowed it to be legal. As a result, there was no legal basis for the war, no matter what they tell you. And no one was talking about it. Do you also remember when it came out under WikiLeaks, 10 million documents, not one was ever proven to be inaccurate. And it stated that Hillary Clinton had demanded that all of the employees at the UN try to get compromising information, everything from people's DNA, like at a cocktail party, you know, take their glass after they've had the wine, get information that could be used against them. Do you also remember when it turned out that she was sponsoring the Trans-Pacific Partnership as Secretary of State? And behind the scenes, WikiLeaks showed that she was agreeing with 44 countries, pressuring them to take the trade agreement. And, but telling the people, oh, we're going to trust that the unions know best and we're not going to do anything that would undermine unions. The very same type of lies that her and her husband engaged in when it came to uh, NAFTA which eviscerated the unions in the United States. Now, here's what we know. We know and by the way, she also strong-armed countries that if they didn't take our GMOs, there would be consequences to pay from the United States to them. So she was strong-arming, and yet the media refused to cover any of this. Well, Gunn had a conscience, and she didn't believe that we should be going into a war that was unjustified because there were inspectors already there that the mainstream media was not interviewing, showing that there were no weapons of mass destruction. In fact, there was evidence on my radio show before any other media, we showed that the person that was being called the expert, do you remember what his code name was? Curveball. He had already been debriefed and they found that he was a liar. But Judith Miller, working with intelligence in a circular manner out of Dick Cheney's office, because when Cheney couldn't get the information he needed in order to justify attacking 
Iraq. He then created it himself. He and, um, and let's see, there was uh, Wol uh, Rumsfeld and, and Wolfowitz, a group of them, and Tenet. They took, they cherry picked people out of CIA, put them in the vice president's office, uh, Libby's office, uh, his uh, chief of staff, and they created their own intelligence. The people who were the career intelligence officers of the CIA knew this was not legitimate. It didn't pass the smell test, but that didn't matter. They gave this information to Judith Miller, and Miller then convinced the New York Times as they were on this great scoop and they had the proof. Who at the New York Times resigned because they caused the unnecessary deaths of at least a million people, the displacement of at least 10 million people, and all the destruction of that country, including all the deaths and the fighting between Shia and Sunni. Who at the New York Times said, I'm gonna fall on my sword because what we caused to happen is so reprehensible, it represents a crime against humanity. Who? Nobody. Nobody at the New York Times. What does that tell you about the integrity of the people working at the New York Times on this story? What does it tell you about war criminals being able to lie with impunity. But it's not just Cheney and Wolfowitz and Condoleezza Rice and Colin Powell at the UN. It was all made up. None of it was real, none of it. But we needed that for a deeper agenda. Just like uh, attacking Trump. There's a lot of reasons to attack Trump, by the way. I don't really believe in attacking Trump because to do so, you would have to put yourself in the shoes of an eight-year-old boy being challenged. <laughs> it almost represents child abuse. Man, he is one overripe banana. But you don't create a coup. He's talking about the coup. We've just gone through two and a half years of a coup. Now the real information is going to be coming out. Who is behind it? CNN was supporting it. The CNN hires and MSNBC hires the two leading known lying intelligence chief, the head of the CIA and, uh, and also the head of the National Security Agency. And they were caught lying. But suddenly that doesn't matter. Suddenly it's just, it's all Russia all the time. And they tried to say that Julian Assange did this. In fact, you remember when CNN ran a report recently about Julian Assange that he was spreading human feces on the embassy walls and in England and that he was meeting with, you know, hackers, all lies. In fact, tomorrow, the next day on my radio show, I'm going to play you the person who worked there full time in the Ecuadorian embassy who said none of that was true. None of it. After all, he said this wasn't a prison and he was not an inmate. You know, he was there as a political, a political uh, prisoner because he could not go outside. But to this day, he has not been shown to have lied, not once. They've done everything to destroy his reputation. How could a good journalist, a journalist like Chris Hedges or Abby Martin or all the people working at the Black Agenda Report, you would never see those people putting misinformation up because it serves an ideological, political, or economic bias need. But that's the only information we get from the mainstream media. The mainstream media will not touch the story of 9-11 because it was refusing to look for the truth of why we were in Iraq, why we were in Afghanistan, and did they ever condemn Hillary and Bill Clinton for the unnecessary deaths of between 500 to 680,000 children from sanctions in 1991? when Leslie Stahl on 60 Minutes uh, asked, uh, uh, let's see, it was Madame Albright. And uh, is it worth it, was what she said, the death of a half a million children. And she said, yes. Why didn't the left become outraged? Since when is a decision to cause the death of a half a million children, innocent children, when is that acceptable? It's not. I grew up in an in environment believing in ultra-liberalism, which today we call progressivism. You look for the truth. I'm not bound by an ideology. 
I'm not bound by any politics. I'm not bound by anyone out there who's trying to motivate me based upon some impersonal or personal need they have and to promote it. I'm bound by the truth. Wherever the truth is, I'm going to go dig it up and present it. The trouble is today, all we do is present ideological truths that are disconnected from any larger reality. As a result, we do not hold those people responsible for the crimes of commission and omission they've engaged in in the name of peace and freedom and democracy. Because let me go to any country, I don't care which country it is, where they were going to bring peace, democracy, and freedom. Let's say Libya. We were told Gaddafi was a nut job killing his own people. Not true. He hadn't even been in power for the previous four years. Which country in the world has the greatest personalized democratic institutions? Which country? Libya. Libya. Everything is decided not by a central government, not by a potentate, not by a dictator, not by a despotic, uh, sorry-ass person like the, the, the head of Saudi Arabia, uh, the crown prince. No, it's decided by committees. In Libya, you have more freedom for Muslim women than any other country, Muslim country in the world. If you insult a woman in Libya, you can go to jail. Libya, the highest standard of education in Africa, the 54 countries in Africa, the longest longevity in Africa, no debt, safe, the Paris of Africa. And they shared the oil revenues with all of the citizens. When you got married, you got cash. If you had a disease, it was treated. If they couldn't treat it in there, you could go to any country in the world and get any treatment you needed, and they paid for it. If you couldn't get the education you wanted, then they would let you go to Harvard, Oxford. They would pay for everything. Yes, you wanted a farm, they would buy you land and pay for everything on that farm. Created the largest irrigation project in world history to help all the other people. And we're invading nobody. Yet it was a part of the geological, uh, ge uh, the geophysic nature that we needed their oil. They have one of the best oils in the world, the sweet crude. But we also wanted Iran out, Iraq out, Libya out. And this happened before 9-11. They let us know what they intended to do. And now they control the media. They can do anything. They don't even have to hide it anymore. They don't have to hide their biases and prejudices. So your truth today is completely different than a universal truth where you're looking for what is right. What is the end game? What is the... What is the point of the exercise? We just want to know, was there a conspiracy behind this? And if so, what is the evidence? And to get that evidence, we need to have the government's own witnesses under oath testify, including George Bush and Dick Cheney and others. Put those clowns under oath. We need to put Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton under oath. Barack Obama under oath. We need to put everybody who's been in the White House since Ronald Reagan under oath and their secretaries of state and everyone at the CIA and the National Security Agency. We don't need any of these 17 federal agencies spying on us. We have what one person said was creeping totalitarianism. Every day they're taking away our rights. So all of you for being here today, you will now be considered suspect. Domestic terrorists, because you seek the truth, even those of you who've lost families. If you have a child that was vaccinated and end up with autism, and you go to the research and you find that there's no study showing a placebo-controlled study with a saline solution versus a vaccine, it's a vaccine versus a vaccine. Did you know that every single one of their placebo studies used a vaccine against a vaccine? That's stupid. I'm a scientist. 30 years, research fellow at the Institute of Applied Biology, the head of anti-aging medicine, published in peer-reviewed journals, done 40 clinical studies. So I can't be fooled. But they're t telling you vaccines have been proven safe and effective. Prove it to me. I've spent almost 20,000 hours reading the subject. But they get away with it because the New York Times refuses to look for the truth, as does CNN, as the Surgeon General, as the CDC, as the FDA, as the U.S. Public Health Service, 
And now they not only want to not allow you to have freedom of choice over your body, but hold on a second. Didn't we just have a major, major issue for the last 50 years? My body, my choice. My hope is that if you take that seriously, you think well of all the consequences before you make your choice. But it's your choice. But why is it when I don't want to put a vaccine in my body, or you don't want to put a vaccine in your kid's body, it's no longer your body. It's the New York Times body. It's the Washington Post body that wants to have you arrested and put in jail. Since when do we think it's normal for the mainstream media to become dictatorial and fascistic? If we want a lesson in fascism, let's get some films from the 1930s and show them and put them side by side in the propaganda going on under Joseph Goebbels and what's going on now at the New York Times. And I'd like to see the difference. I don't back off in the face of punks. And these are goddamn punks. They're not decent human beings. They're not ethical journalists. They're not looking for the truth. I don't give a shit what they think. So remember this, your truth is their lie. And they have to live with being liars and propagandists and apologists and promoters of people who want you to have the vaccines mandated, who want you to eat genetically engineered food, who want to put smart meters and 5G technology that is infecting your brain and impacting your body. They don't care about global warming. These elitists are out there flying in private jets. They're eating steak. They mock and ridicule the, those of us like myself who are vegans and buy locally grown produce to support low carbon footprints. They don't care about the environment. They only care about themselves and the power they've been able to amass. But there's an old saying, the king and the peasant both go in the same dirt when they're dead. <laughs> we, need, we need to share information about what's wrong with the information they're giving us. Because you cannot engage in, a, in an authentic life until you know the truth of how you should live that life. What are the ideals? What are the manners? What are the ethics? What is the ethos that we should be living by? Honor, honesty, integrity, honoring all life. Do not segregate, do not be prejudice. Do not engage in identity politics. Don't allow people to be separated and fighting each other and while they're fighting each other over who's smartest, who's right, who's white, who's black. These are all stupid concepts and they're controlling everything because then they don't have to tell us why they have done nothing, nothing to eliminate money in politics, to allow Citizens United to be re re revoked, to re-engage the Glass-Steagall Act, which Clinton's engaged to bring back manufacturing into the United States and to have tax-free zones, to give loans interest-free to small business people as long as they hire people at a living wage. For every million dollar loan they get, they get three years to start paying it back with no interest, just like they gave those trillions of dollars to Wall Street, but didn't stop a single home from being foreclosed on, didn't help a small business person, didn't help a person that was paying usurious rates and living underwater and the stress that that causes. They profit by getting you sick, and then they profit by trying to treat you in their worthless mannerisms. <laughs> so you think I'm going to apologize for being right? I do not grovel at the feet of arrogance, hubris, and narcissism, and that's the entire, entire Washington consensus and all those putrid assholes in Washington and Wall Street and New York and the banks and the television networks. Never forget how human you are and never be deceived by how lacking in humanity they are. You keep the truth on your side, which is universal, and they'll keep the lies on their side. At this moment, they win because they control all mechanisms of who will be believed and who will be challenged. They control Wikipedia. Well, you see what I'm doing to Wikipedia. If you listen tomorrow, oh, Monday, I'm taking it down a notch too. 38 articles against them. And the fact that they are there as a propagandist, they're not a legitimate encyclopedia. Encyclopedia Britannica is legitimate where you know someone's name. You can see their curriculum vitae. You, if there's an error, you can get it corrected. No, on Wikipedia, 
no, Skeptics Anonymous, who can attack someone for believing that 9-11 has more to the story than what we've been told, you're considered a conspiracy theorist. No matter what your background, no matter how legitimate you are, you will be condemned by people you will never see. That is fascism. That's what, that's, that's Stasiism. That shouldn't exist in this country. So we're taking on Wikipedia. The goal is to get hearings where those of us who can tell the truth and our experts can present it and show that Jimmy Wells, and those skeptics, and those other people, they should not have that forum and they should be allowed to be sued. Right now you can't sue them, but we're about to change that because we can sue the individual editors and we've been able in the last week to uncover the real identities. This week they get sued. So we've got, you know, everything happens when the lights are off. Turn the lights on, the truth is the light, and watch those people run like cockroaches. And that's about the equivalency of anything representing human in the body politic at this moment. Thank you all. Thank you, Gary. Yeah, I got to do it. There's two publishers in there. Thank you. Right. Before I, uh, I introduce our next speaker, I just have to qualify something for the Lawyers Committee, which I should have said at the beginning. Uh, we're here to be educated, and we've invited some amazing speakers, as you know. The Lawyers Committee has a, a structure, it's a nonprofit organization. So we uh, support the free exchange of information. We do not necessarily support any individual statements as a corporation because our board has not voted on it. We voted on uh, a grand jury petition. We voted on suing the FBI in Washington and suing the U.S. Attorney in New York. But a lot of the things that the speakers will say, we haven't discussed. We have our own personal views, and uh, maybe you can indicate, it's an indication of maybe what we may think of the speaker because they're here to share their information. But any information that's up here that's put out by a speaker is their information, and it's not information that was basically put before the board to decide whether we support that particular position or another position. That's a disclaimer. I should put that at the beginning of the program, but I thought it would be good to put now. <laughs> All right. Now, I just also want to mention, uh, before our next speaker comes out, there's a, uh, the Schiller Institute, New York City Chorus, is sponsoring a 9 memorial Sunday, September 8th, 2019, that's tomorrow, four o'clock to 6 p.m. That's at the St. Veronica Creative Cultural Center, 149 Christopher Street in New York. I will have another or two announcements before the end of the day uh, to give you. Now, our next speaker is very well known in the area too. He's from New York City area, and that's Mark Crispin Miller. Uh, uh, Mark is a professor. Mark is a professor of media studies at New York University. I actually went to graduate school at NYU, and is the author of a book, Fooled Again, How the Right Stole the 2004 Elections. He is known for his writing on American media and for his activism on behalf of democratic media reform. His books include Boxed In, The Culture of TV Seeing Through Movies, and Mad Scientist, A Study of War Propaganda. He graduated from Northwestern University with a BA in 1971, John Hopkins University with an MA in 1973, and a PhD in 1977. Welcome, Mark Crispin Miller. <laughs> Okay, uh, I did not run m my notes past the lawyers committee, so you can't blame them for anything I'm about to say. 
um, I was asked to talk about intelligence strategies utilized to undermine legitimate, um, what is it? Uh, criticism, right. Is that better? You can hear me now? Yeah, I was asked to talk about intelligence strategies utilized to undermine legitimate criticism. Now I could talk about that subject for, well, for a whole semester. <laughs> and I'm doing that now at NYU, and I only have 20 or so minutes to try to do it here. So um, I'm just gonna mention two such strategies very quickly and then focus on a third. Um, the first uh, of those intelligence strategies, and this is something that Gary just uh, essentially talked about, is uh, censorship uh, through control of the press. Uh, the American media has long since been uh, kind of taken over by the intelligence establishment, and that's especially true of the New York Times and the Washington Post, but the rest of them as well. I don't recall reading about the AUF study that fires couldn't have brought down Building 7. I don't recall seeing that in the New York Times. Did, am I right about that? And somehow I m missed the New York Times' uh, report of the fire commissioner's statement calling for a new inquiry. Is, is that just, it was in, in the copy that I get, um, unhappily get delivered to my apartment? No, they don't report anything like that. Um, it really is not an exaggeration to say that the press, the US press today, our free press, as I always call it with scare quotes, is really comparable uh, to the uh, press uh, in the Third Reich. It, it really is in terms of its, you laugh, uh, that's a position I'm actually prepared to uh, demonstrate in great detail, but that is essentially the result of the uh, merger of uh, the fourth estate in this country with the uh, intelligence establishment, mainly the CIA, also the DIA, uh, and the CDC, and the FCC, and the FBI, and so on. Uh, the second uh, st such strategy that I'll just mention very quickly is uh, the infiltration of uh, the critical community and the deliberate uh, uh, sowing of division within that community. Um, uh, Commissioner Joya mentioned some uh, uh, notions about 9-11 and its responsibility that are sort of groundless and reckless. Um, it's not really a stretch, it doesn't take a stretch of the imagination to assume that some of those um, notions have been deliberately um, propagated, uh, again, by the intelligence community. So some of you may have heard of Cass Sunstein, who worked under Obama, and I think probably was hired by the Obama administration because of a piece he wrote uh, when he was at Harvard advising uh, the tactic of cognitive infiltration by which he meant deliberately um, derailing the 9-11 truth movement by uh, posting uh, divisive and hostile and misleading information in their chat rooms and so on. So this is a, you know, a constitutional scholar who is you know, recommending a covert means of derailing legitimate criticism in what we like to think of as a democracy. Uh, that's the second one, but the third one, the one I'm going to focus on, and it's one that Gary mentioned uh, passingly, is the weaponization of the phrase conspiracy theory uh, or conspiracy theorist as a way to uh, make people distrust their own critical faculties, as a way to make people feel they have to apologize for perfectly legitimate suspicions about uh, elite intentions. This you know, brief history lesson, and, and incidentally, I, I'm hoping that this, uh, these remarks of mine will help to contextualize what we're focusing on today, 9-11 uh, itself. I wanna try to place it within the larger context of uh, you know, uh, uh, what we might call deep state shenanigans uh, really since 1963, since the Kennedy assassination. 
1967, early 1967, as many of you know, the CIA sent all its station chiefs worldwide a memo, memo 1035 slash 960. Uh, what that memo did was advise its station chiefs to help to solve the problem of increasing mass skepticism toward the Warren Commission uh, th uh, theory of a lone gunman killing JFK, uh, to try to counter that skepticism basically by defaming uh, those most prominent critics like Mark Lane and others whose works were uh, increasingly widely read, uh, his, his rush to judgment, uh, Sylvia Mayer's accessories after the fact, other works that were raising perfectly legitimate questions about the Warren Report. So what um, the memo basically advised its station chiefs to do was to uh, cultivate their uh, me uh, uh, propaganda assets and friends in the media to discredit the work of these conspiracy theorists uh, wherever possible and then the memo advised a number of uh, what we would call today talking points in order to uh, uh, d make these people seem either insane or venal or both, okay? So um, th this, it's interesting, prior to this uh, memo's release in 67, the phrase conspiracy theory was used only now and then in the US press and uh, inconsistently in different ways. Starting in 1967, uh, increasingly over the decades, ever since up till the present moment, that phrase, those phrases were used more and more and more uh, and always in the same way, always to laugh off uh, suggestions, speculations, criticisms that pointed in the direction of high crimes by the US government against democracy, okay? I mean, it's a dramatic shift from, from rare uses of those phrases to constant, obsessive, pounding home of those phrases to the point that uh, uh, now Americans basically uh, take a kind of sentimental view of executive authority and of the elites because there's, there's something wrong with you if you doubt the official story. This is kind of a new thing. Let me recommend very strongly uh, Lance DeHaven Smith's great book, Conspiracy Theory in America. I'm proud to say I suggested to him that he write the book. It's published by the University of Texas Press. It's an indispensable book. Now, what, what this propaganda drive has done, and it is arguably, arguably the most successful propaganda drive in American history, because it is not only uh, discredited, you know, disparate uh, uh, kinds of inquiry, but it has uh, discredited across the board any attempt to raise any questions about any official story. It's had a kind of prophylactic effect so that the mind cannot be inseminated by heretical thoughts, you know, and it's a, it's a prophylactic that you can only remove with great difficulty and with a lot of pain. You know what I'm saying? I know this because I teach. So, you know, students are in visible agony as, as they, oh, geez, that, really? All right. So what, what the conspiracy theory charge has done is specifically is to trump, so to speak, trump science. Okay, the mind that has been calcified by the conspiracy theory meme. Uh, is, is completely impenetrable by any inconvenient information. That kind of thing just bounces right off your brain. And I have to say that this is actually a worse problem, a more serious problem, and a more dangerous problem among liberals and progressives than it is out on the right, okay? No, we, we love to hear, wait, I, I gotta finish, okay? I appreciate the applause, but, Hold it, I've got so many things to say. You know, we all love to snicker at Republican superstitiousness and the view that America was founded as a Christian nation or that the universe is 6,000 years old. We chortle about this, we think, oh, those right-wingers, they're so stupid. They don't believe in science. 
Well, actually, it's, 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 it's most liberals uh, who are actually uh, far more subject to ludic ludicrously unscientific notions and much more dangerous notions than uh, people on the right, okay? And this goes back to the Kennedy assassination, okay? This is where much begins, okay? Uh, what we're dealing with today and trying to tell some truth about 9-11 points back to 1963, the propagation of this preposterous notion that Lee Harvey Oswald himself killed JFK, something, something that two thirds of the American people no longer believe. The New York Times believes it as religiously as ever, right? I mean, I don't know what kind of blood oaths they have to take to join that workforce, uh, but it's the same with the, well, actually not the Washington Post, but the Times in particular is stuck in, in, in the 60s still flogging the Warren Report, and of the many absolutely preposterous notions on which that narrative depends, the most ridiculous is the magic bullet theory, right? You've all heard this, the same bullet, you know, went through Kennedy and changed course and turned around and went through various parts of John Connolly's body and then ended up on a stretcher in pristine condition. Yeah, that's right, very scientific. That's not junk science, right? That's right, not junk science. So uh, John Kennedy was shot in the front from the back, right? And then Bobby Kennedy was shot in the back from the front, right? Sirhan Sirhan, you may have heard, was stabbed in the neck, right? In, his, in the prison where they're keeping him. The New York Times reported this, repeated the same bullshit about how it was Sirhan who shot Kennedy. The coroner of LA County, Thomas Noguchi, ruled that the shot, the fatal shot in Bobby Kennedy's case came from the rear, going upward a couple of inches from the back of his head. Sirhan was about six feet in front of Bobby, firing wildly in all directions, okay? And we're supposed to believe that he was the one who killed RFK? That's also an example of junk science, right? As is the NIST report on the collapse of Building 7, on its face, laughable, ridiculous. What if it had been Putin who put out that, that argument, right? Would anybody have any trouble saying, oh, that's absurd? No, but it happens here, see? Under the spell of the conspiracy theory meme, we feel we have to apologize if we suspect that the official, or admit that the official story is completely ridiculous. Now I can, rush through a number of other examples. Uh, there's Russiagate, okay? That is actually a conspiracy theory in the sense uh, of the memo. I mean, it's a completely ridiculous theory with no scientific basis and which has been authoritatively debunked by the VIPS study, V-I-P-S study that Bill Binney was part of, which demonstrated that the DNC emails vanished too quickly from that database to have been a hack. It was a download. And it was probably Seth Rich who downloaded it. I mean, that's a name we're not supposed to mention because that's conspiracy theory, right? <sighs> we could then move from Russiagate to the problem of election theft, which has been demonstrably carried out time and time again in this country, primarily through electronic means by Republican operatives Russia has nothing to do with it, right? But this is called, again, conspiracy theory. It can't possibly be true. Gary mentioned vaccines, okay? Here again, it is, it is liberals, it is the liberal state of California that has just passed SB 276, the most draconian law against uh, vaccine exemptions in the whole country, right? There is no scientific evidence to support the massive attacks on infant bodies with, with, with dozens of vaccines, right? Uh, should I keep going? All right. Um, well, Epstein, they've, they've, they've kind of, They've kind of jumped the shark with Epstein, if you know what I mean, right? It's a little, it's a bridge too far. Although I have to say um, that 
while the evidence is sort of um, compelling that he did not kill himself, but was murdered, we also have to entertain the possibility that he wasn't killed at all and that he got away. Okay. All right. I said it. I didn't run it past the lawyers committee. And for that, I apologize. Uh, there's, okay, I, I feel like I'm being asked to play certain hits, you know. Uh, the cell phone radiation, which the New York Times has laughed off, it's not a problem at all. Uh, there's 5G, which Gary mentioned, which is which terrifyingly dangerous, for which there is not a, you know, abundant scientific evidence against its use. And the New York Times has outrageously promoted it as perfectly safe. I reckon in part because its largest single shareholder, Carlos Slim of Mexico, made his billions on the cell phone trade south of the border. It's also a fact that the New York Times has a business deal with Verizon to set up a 5G lab, okay? Uh, that couldn't have anything to do with this unconscionable promotion of an extremely dangerous technology, which is really basically gonna enable the government to seize all of our data more quickly, you know, using our microwaves and all the other stuff that's uh, part of the internet of things. There's also, uh, I mean, there's also transgenderism. I don't mean transgender persons. Uh, I have colleagues, friends who are transgender. I'm talking about the ideology, the movement, the notion that you can become a woman if you just say you're one, you know, which is uh, a, an essentially misogynistic move that is posing a grave threat to women's and girls' athletics, which is uh, an, a tremendous, highly profitable boon to big pharma and the medical industrial complex. We're talking about um, uh, dire medical intervention in the lives and minds of very young children. It is a grotesque uh, delusion to uh, claim that, that the transgenderist ideology has any scientific basis at all. And here again, it's promoted mainly uh, by, by liberals and opposed by the right and as uh, radical feminists as well. Okay, I only have a couple minutes left. Now, um, what I want to note here is that what I'm describing is actually getting exponentially worse as we sit here, uh, more dangerous. Uh, the FBI recently came out with the statement that conspiracy theories comprise a new domestic terrorism threat. I don't know if you've heard this. Uh, and they talk about those whose thinking is, quote, you'll love this, at odds with official or prevailing explanations of events, okay? This makes everyone in this room a, a domestic terrorism threat. Uh, DARPA, the Defense um, Advanced uh, Research Projects Agency, helped invent the internet, is now working on a means of ensuring that we know, thanks to them, thanks to the Pentagon, that we know what's true and what isn't. Okay, we're talking about the militarization of, of, of thinking, of consciousness. This is something that George Orwell could not have imagined in his wildest dreams. It is a kind of surveillance uh, 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 of, of unimaginable scale and sophistication and exquisiteness working through our cell phones and our computers. Uh, and we are talking therefore about um, a move whose lethal impact is incalculable. Now, the delusions of the right that the universe is 6,000 years old, I mean, it's unfortunate, but it is nowhere near as dangerous. Uh, it does not have anywhere near, could not have anywhere near the genocidal impact uh, that has been, um, uh, that we can basically attribute to the lies that have been pushed by the state over the last half century or so, endless wars promoted and enabled by these lies. 9-11 and the war on terror is only the latest chapter uh, uh, in this long history. Uh, 
the movement has had its martyrs, you know, Barry Jennings, Philip Marshall, and there have been countless people who've been fired because of their adherence to the truth. Uh, as frightening as our opposition is, we are obliged to continue to stick to the truth, to speak the truth, no matter what they try to bring against us, because ultimately, inevitably, the truth will triumph. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mark Crispin Miller. Very good. Uh, we have one more speaker who's going to be coming in on a live stream from uh, uh, zoomed in from Florida. It was, she was a first responder uh, down in uh, Ground Zero, and uh, her name is Rachel Hughes. Now, before we introduce Rachel, a uh, few things I want to say that we're going to have a question and answer period, time allowing. Uh, we have to get out at 7 o'clock. So uh, if you have cards and you filled out, Les Jamison will be going down the aisle, take a card if you have questions to ask. I want to acknowledge a few people. George Capsis from the Westview News. George, maybe you could stand up. All right, he's here. George has a... Uh, a, a newspaper in the West Village. And uh, also, Chris Flash is here from Shadow Newspaper. Chris, somewhere here. Okay. Thank you for coming. Thank you for co covering this event. Uh, when we do leave, there's trash. You should take it in the back and, and dump the trash back there. And uh, these towers, pretty amazing. Ross Muir, one of our readers of the roll call, built the towers, right? And Ross also sent the banner up. He's a very brave man. He's up the 20-foot ladder, okay, to do that. There's a lot of people that were involved here. The Truth Action Project people were amazing. Mike Santangelo and all you people in that organization are super. They really uh, helped make this happen. I want to thank the videographer, too, from Wook and Joe Friendly, and uh, also uh, No Lies Radio that's live streaming this right now. So as I mentioned, Rachel Hughes is a, uh, was a first responder, and she's very sick today. She told me she has nine different ailments or sicknesses diagnosed from working as a first responder at Grand Zero. 9-11. Uh, so if we're ready to bring Rachel on, please do. Okay. Thank you. I want to thank all those speaking here today, all the production people and the audience near and far. I really made a huge attempt to be there in person with all of you. I've been seeing doctors for immune treatments out of state and I spent actually all day yesterday traveling uh, to try to get up to New York City. I made it as far as Washington DC before symptoms elevated with headache and fever and I have uh, excessive neuropathy pain so it made continuing my travels up there today impossible but I wish I was there. Before I begin I have uh, like a one minute disclaimer uh, I'm here because I've been chronically and systemically ill from my time volunteering in the 9-11 toxic dust. But before I formally introduce myself and further share details of my 9-11 health journey, I'd like to apologize in advance if I become emotional or need to pause a moment. I'm not a, a hysterical or overly emotional person. I'm logical, creative, striving for wellness and balance. And because love is the essence of the soul and we cannot have love without truth, I'm a truth seeker. And I want this in my life. I want love and I want truth in my life. 
for the next 10 to 15 minutes or so, please bear with me. I'm sorry if I go too slow or need to pause. I have throat and lung pain on every breath, the pain and fatigue to exert this any, this, <coughs> the pain and fatigue to exert this kind of energy is excruciating. And well, the topic of 9-11 toxin exposure, the 9-11 illnesses now called the World Trade Center syndrome, it has been re-victimizing us for 18 years. And that is an, an emotional grief I carry that affects my ability to speak smoothly and even to face this entire injustice. Everything I am sharing here is my humble opinion. I am not for any government politics that is used to divide we the people. So please do not align me with any ineffective, greedy religion or organization or any political party. I'm no longer a party affiliate of the Democrats or the Republicans. I'm not aligned with any president or Congress or Senate members, though I wish I could be. I'm disgusted by all infiltrators harming us, our children and our world. I'm for those who seek root causes and provide solutions that empower humanity to thrive, regardless of race, religion, or political affiliations. Because these are not the Democrats of our JFK who vowed to end the Federal Reserve and dismantle the corrupt alphabet agencies. These are not the Republicans who claim to be serving God as the Christian base. In my humble opinion, we have all been made fools of by snarky infiltrators with maybe, I don't know, 20% in government who still have their human souls intact. And for me, I align with God as the energy of love, the love that embodies truth, justice, wellness, balance, and all that is good and truly righteous. And that is what I choose to align with in this battle to expose 9-11 and restore our human rights. The corruption against us is all interconnected. And it's up to us, we the people, sovereign in our right to freedom and the pursuit of happiness. We cannot let anti-American traitors divide us further. And to protect our human rights, we much, <coughs> to protect our human rights, we must find the issues that bring us together. We must take back our power as one nation under God of love and truth, unified to expose and remove those that seek to destroy our lives. We are all mind, soul, body, and this is our United States. We are America the beautiful. I am simply a patriot, a citizen seeking truth and justice. I'm terrified of public speaking. My racing heart aches and I too, I want to put my head in the sand and hide from all this corruption. But I've learned there is healing in sharing and that is why I started speaking out. In 2005 with the 9-11 Dust and Deceit film and in 2011 with the 9-11 Healing Journey film, both done by filmmaker Penny Little with the support of Mr. Walter and a great team of patriots. But did the public care about our films? Few did because our films were hijacked, dragged through court and our sick and dying voices censored, making it even more difficult for us to get proper medical help for the root causes of the 9-11 illnesses that we're suffering from. I do not know how much more time I will have in this life. This is why I attempted to drag my aching, painful, toxin and drug affected, misshapen body to be with you all today. I failed, so we have found another way and I'm, I'm grateful for that. I wanted to be front and center with you all, even now sick from bed. I'm letting my voice be heard. Investigation. So in 
So, hi everyone. Don't think it ends there. That was just a disclaimer. As over the years, many have tried to twist my words and disregard my voice with political excuses. Now I will attempt to summarize my journey. In the last 18 years, those of us suffering from the 9-11 toxins have endured. My name is Rachel. I'm a citizen of the United States of America. That means I'm a person loyal to my country and entitled by birth or legal immigration to be protected by our states and nation. I am entitled to my sovereign human rights. I'm not sharing my story. I'm not sharing my story to evoke people to feel sorry for me because I can do that all on my own as I have endured the systemic pain and chronic symptoms caused by the 9-11 toxins now for 18 years. I'm here for a call to action and to share how horrific the symptoms of the World Trade Center syndrome have been because along with thousands of other 9-11 first responders and volunteers and those fighting for our lives, like John Feel and his team, so much gratitude, but we still need help. I need help. I need help so I do not die prematurely. I need the proper detox and immune boosting treatments, which I have not been able to afford consistently. And these treatments are still not covered by the 9-11 health programs. There are wellness protocols that we have been prevented from receiving, even though there are treatments that can help us be well again, or at least get some quality of life back. I live on $1,300 a month disability and Medicare and have to choose between homelessness or paying out of pocket for the IV immune treatments that lessen my symptoms. I have sold everything I own of value to pay out of pocket for these weekly treatments to the point of losing my homes to foreclosure, my car to repossession, my retirement fund down to zero. I am no longer the healthy, energized, vibrant person I was on September 10th, 2001. I've lost everything that I worked for in my life. Recently, because of the diligence of John Field's team fighting 18 years, you guys, 18 years for the medical support we need, we were granted an extended funding of the 9-11 treatment programs. That was step one of the battle for 9-11 victims to be cared for. That took 18 years and now more people have died of the toxin illnesses. More people have died of the 9-11 toxin illnesses than died on the day of September 11th. And the murders continue. Step two is we need the treatments that work to get us well. These must be covered by the funding instead of forcing us to accept prescription-based treatment that causes additional debilitating symptoms. Step two needs to happen immediately or more of us will continue to suffer and die at a rapid rate. We need proper medical care that addresses the root cause, that addresses the root cause of our illness, which is toxin poisoning. The long list of toxins that we were exposed to is available online, so I'm not gonna take the time to read it all here but it included mercury, lead, cadmium, aluminum, and found in my test was also radiation, radiation poisoning. So I wonder where that came from. Just another reason we need the grand jury investigation into the 9-11 attacks. How many of you out there knew that hundreds of thousands of people are sick from 9-11 toxins? Did you know that more people have been murdered by the toxin exposure after 9-11 than died on the day of? If you have not heard of this, do you wonder why the government and the MSM has failed to do proper investigative journalism and report this ongoing crime against we, the American people? Have you thought about it? Why are those of us suffering chronic systemic illness from 9-11 toxin exposure not receiving acknowledgement, much, much less the medical care we need to fully detox and reboost our immune so that we can heal. Dear President Trump, we also deserve the right to try. We should not be forced into taking prescriptions as a first line of attack when we need treatments that can really help us get well. 
I'm going to attempt to summarize the last 18 years of my decaying health from 9-11. In 2001, three months after my 35th birthday, I volunteered at Ground Zero, the 9-11 site for two weeks, and then returned to work at my corporate office in the vicinity of Ground Zero. I was exposed to the toxic dust for three months and was laid off from my career in December 2001. On 9-12, the first day I volunteered, my symptoms of headache, stomach pain, cough, sinus pain, and lung congested, congestion started. Along with painful weeping skin lesions and hair loss, it was October of 2001 that I began to see doctors as high grade fevers and dizziness were making my return to work difficult. I began to live on Tylenol and sleep meds. For the next three years, I was misdiagnosed by all of my regular insurance plan MDs. I was put on all kinds of drugs and consistently was on antibiotics for lung infections. Today, 18 years later, all of those original symptoms have continued and added side effects from the medications have worsened the long list of diagnosed and certified illnesses. On average, the number of days I run fevers within a year has been around 160 days per year. Because I've had little funds for treatment this year, I'm already at 163 days with fevers over 100, and we still have three more months of the year to go. Before I was entered into the official 9-11 World Trade Center Health Treatment Program in 2005, I had found four second opinion integrative medical doctors, MDs, that did body burden and toxin testing on me. And it showed that I had high levels of toxins. They started me on a chelation and IV immune boosting therapies and my symptoms began to lessen but I had run out of money and I was paying out of pocket for those very expensive treatments. I was told that the 9-11 treatment program was covering protocols for those affected by 9-11 toxin exposure. So I entered the program and presented these findings asking for help paying for the treatments that were getting me well. On the treatments, all symptoms lessened and I was able to work a few part-time hours a week while still getting treatments three days a week. All I want is my life back. Baby steps, I thought, but that was 2005. Once in the 9-11 health program, my request for the treatments that were previously working were denied. And I was given prescription-based treatments to band-aid symptoms but not given the detoxing and immune building that is required to heal from a toxin exposure. I was in so much distress physically and dealing with PTSD and, men and mentally trying to overcome situational depression from the loss of my healthy life that I was desperate. So I tried everything the 9-11 treatment pro program told me to do and my health worsened. I could no longer live full-time in New York City, in my home. It was too dirty. My lungs were failing me. My body could no longer regulate temperature and I couldn't be in too cold or too hot environments. I sublet in my home in Brooklyn and went to see more affordable doctors out of state who focused on detoxing and Im immune building. Because of this, it was suggested by the 9-11 program advisors that I enter the national 9-11 health insurance program. As soon as I did that, my certified diagnosis, diagnosis records went missing, and they have refused to cover any of my treatments with the exception of asthma, which they will give me inhaler band-aids, but refuse to cover the nebulizer treatment or the oxygen or the IV immune boost that reduce all the symptoms of asthma and COPD. I was diagnosed with adrenal insufficiency in 2004 and have multiple doctor's letters to the World Trade Center program telling them that if I do not get the toxins removed and the immune re rebuilt, that I could end up with 
Addison's disease and more complicated illnesses. In 2008, my adrenal function failed and I am now kept alive on steroid medications because I never got the treatments that I needed. So from 2005 to 2009, because I was told to apply for 9-11 World Trade Center workers' compensation, I had to take the money from that check and apply it to pay out of pocket for the treatments that were working, following the treatments that help reduce symptoms and could potentially restore my health it takes about 30 hours a week, two hours of lymphatic drainage every morning, kidney and liver flushes during the day and at night, GI detoxes and three IV immune boosts weekly with every third week doing chelation to slowly, safely remove the 9-11 toxins. I was managing this with the support of doctors that the 9-11 medical programs refused to reimburse. I was told I had to go to 9-11 workers' compensation court to apply for added benefits in 2009. I entered the workers' comp court system of lying judges and corrupt attorneys. And I'm calling all of you out because this is wrong. It's wrong what has happened to all of us. Instead of helping me, they stopped my payments and I've been dragged through court for over 10 years now. A few years ago, because I have all my records, all the copies to prove what I need, a workers' compensation judge finally ruled in my favor for one third of the money I paid out of pocket to be reimbursed to me. This was around $100,000 plus, and it's on the court record. To gain the full amount, I would still have to provide more records, which I could get. And I was so grateful and so hopeful that at least with a partial reimbursement, I would be able to start my treatments up again. But right after that ruling, my attorney disappeared, stopped returning my emails and calls, and a letter came from workers' comp stating that they didn't agree with the judge's findings and were not going to make the payment that the court had ordered. Soon after that, my home went into foreclosure. I had no car, no health insurance to cover what I needed to get well. Seeking wellness solutions on my own has bankrupted me to the point of homelessness because I must choose paying out of pocket for medical treatments that work or a place to live. The money they say, the money they say is for us, they say that is for us is going to the pharmaceutical industry. And the 9-11 workers compensation court system has further destroyed my life. Today, I'm unrecognizable. The vibrant, energized, successful person I once was has been taken from me. Today, I look in the mirror and I can't see me. I know I'm in here. I know I'm in here somewhere, but my soul is struggling to live in an energy and oxygen starved body. But somewhere there is still a small flame, a little light that I cling to as many others do. We are struggling to survive. And I still have hope that I can thrive again, but I know I need the right treatments. I'm asking every human being, every citizen, to stop allowing the infiltrators and deceivers to have power over us, dividing us. I say no more. No more will I be silent. No more will we allow a few to enslave us and harm us. No more. Rachel, thank you very much. Where can we send donations to you? If there's a lot of people in the audience, maybe they want to send a donation. Where could they send a donation to you? Um, I, I have um, an account that some people have, have donated for some treatments that I could share with people. I don't, where do you want me to post it? Well, if you, if you can just tell it to us right now, somebody can write it down maybe or get it out oh, there. It, it's uh, I mean, they can email me at uh, rayhughes1 at gmail.com, and it's R-A-E, Ray, and my last name is Hughes, H-U-G-H-E-S, 1 at gmail.com. Okay, that's Ray, R-A-E, Hughes, 1 at gmail.com, right? Yes. 
Okay, great. Well, thank you very much. All right. Best to you always. Best to you. Thank you. Oh, oh, okay, now we're not going to have time for a question and answer, but uh, that's okay. Excuse me? Uh, I think she's done. I think she's off. So uh, we have to we have to close it down. But thank you all for being here, and uh, this is really a, a tremendous event. And uh, hopefully we can keep the momentum going, and uh, and get to the truth, as Rachel said, and get some justice here. As we started out with the roll call, the first responders, that their sacrifice was in vain, and we uh, we get some justice. Okay, thank you very much. Go home safely. We'll see you next year here, if not sooner, okay? Or wherever. Yeah, I, yeah, I, but the, I think I did already put a plug in and thank the video people, uh, Homok and Joe Friendly, and the people that helped out here. There's glasses up at the, the uh, table as you leave, a pair of glasses, the sunglasses, and a pair of normal prescription glasses. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>